to start our workshop. And uh, first on the agenda is a city council briefing on Urban Renewal Center Impact Youth Summer Camp with a very dear friend of mine, Dr. Anipas Harris. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor Dyer and uh, Council. To uh, Councilman Roos, thank you for the opportunity to share with you some of the work that we've been doing. Uh, over the uh, Christmas break, uh, the Urban Renewal Center did a very large uh, toy drive, and we partnered with uh, Virginia Beach Businesses, Thrivent, um, Vila Fusion Dance Company, and Ms. Marquita Bianca is with me, who is the uh, president of that organization. And we worked at uh, Betty Williams Elementary School, where we provided nearly 1,000 toys for families. And we went out there, met families, and want to build relationship with them. I uh, spent a lot of time uh, in Virginia Beach. Uh, we've had summer camp here. Uh, I worked with superintendent of schools on a special project on diversity a few years ago. And now I want to move away from just merely a summer camp to focus on a year-round program <coughs> that, that really uh, affirms and develops children. Uh, it's called the Impact Youth Arts Program. And the Office of Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention points to several studies uh, that prove that the arts have a positive impact on youth development from birth through adolescence years. Also engaging in various arts activities such as singing, dancing, play, uh, play acting, doing crafts, at a young age is associated with positive social and emotional behaviors, including empathy, sharing, and mood control. Also, the arts prove to be supportive in child development uh, and education <coughs> and education performance. With full understanding that some of the families of Virginia Beach would love to support their children through the arts, they do not have the resources. The URC is requesting public financial resources from the city of Virginia Beach to financially strap parents uh, who, would not, who would not need to pay for their children to get involved in what I call IYAP, uh, which is Impact Youth Arts Program. For up to 50 children to enroll in three cycles of 15-week cohorts, the URC needs $50,000. We're asking Virginia Beach City Council to support the children with a $25,000 public grant. We will seek private sources to, for the remaining financial need. Besides supporting youth in their social and emotional development, post-COVID mood control and academic performance, uh, we want to be part of the city's efforts to preserve the bright vibrancy of the arts in Virginia Beach. And investment in the children will assist in this mission. Uh, the classes will include hip hop dance techniques, jazz dance concepts, ballet and modern dance, theater and acting, <coughs> boat design and crafting. The classes will be taught by top notch Hampton Roads instructors Norfolk Academy's Elbert Watson uh, in, with ballet and modern dance. Virginia Beach's Bela Fusion, Ms. Marquita Bianca, provides hip hop and jazz dance lessons. Former actress Tiffany Williams will lead the theater program, and Tidewater Bo Wooden Boat provides boat design and building instruction. Again, these will be 15 weeks in a cycle, and we will enroll children in an ongoing basis. The focus age is fourth through seventh grade, fourth through seventh grade. Thank you for hearing my proposal, and uh, Mr. Question? Rouse. Yes. And Aaron, thank you for bringing Anapis forward. I think it was a great idea. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Dr. Antipas, for your uh, presentation as well, and thank you for um, finding ways to engage our, our youth um, through the arts, and I think we all understand how, just how important the arts are and um, the ways that we can support it. Uh, so my, my question would be um, approximately how many kids, if you know, if the city does decide to uh, you know, participate in this, how many kids does $25,000 um, help in 
what is that process like? Well, we I budgeted at fifty thousand for fifty three to be specific, fifty three children uh -huh. in the cycle. Uh, my request to you was twenty five, with hopes that we can find other private sector um, grant support uh, for the rest of the way through. Now, the downside of that is that I don't get another twenty five thousand dollars. Well, if that be the case, we would treat the twenty five that if this, the council would support us in this way as a beta testing um, approach. We we'll do one 15 weeks and we'll see how it goes. And we'll be back if we don't, if we need more. All right. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Okay, R Rosemary, Sabrina, Michael. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm a former teacher and I understand education is so important. Uh, where are you going to be doing this? We will be doing it in where you mean specific location? Uh -huh. Well, Bilofusion is located uh, here in Virginia Beach. They have a campus. So we'll be doing uh, much of the dance there and maybe even also doing the, uh, the theater courses. The challenge would be if we have a large number of students who would seek other locations here locally. But we have that because there are um, content provided for dance. So we <coughs> talked to them about using their space as the first point of, um, of concern. So is this going to be all Virginia Beach students, or is this a regional program? or? No, this is for Virginia Beach. Uh -huh. Yeah, our organization um, is focusing on the specific cities, partly because of, of transportation issues. Right, transportation is yeah. always a big yeah. issue. Yeah. Um, so how are you getting the word out for students and also for donations. Great. Uh, we are partnered with the community and schools, and that's how we did our, our drive in, in, at Christmas time in their ongoing partner. They have several schools in Virginia Beach that they are partnered with. We're uh, recruiting students through our connection and partnership with them primarily. We would like to also extend that out to partner with the public schools itself. I will be approaching uh, the superintendent for his support. Uh, once we see that the program is is ready to go, uh, and uh, see if we they may have some facilities. Yes, very possible. You could use. Mm -hmm. I'm also in conversation uh, with um, the Sandler Center Foundation about um, <laughs> connections that they have. I've had conversation with Mr. Michael, the councilman, uh, who's had some <laughs> ideas. <laughs> Um, because of his works in work in the arts, uh, so we're 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 it's an ongoing discovery. Partly has to do with how many children and where the children would be located that will uh, gravitate to our program. Again, we did our tour drive at uh, Betty Williams, so we got a lot of connections there. We talked up our program in uh, in December, and a lot of the parents are very interested. So there's a chance that um, some of the students will come from that region. So at the end of the program, will you be having like a, a, a big recital at the end for, for all of us interested people to come out and see what the children have learned? And uh... Yes. Um, every 15 weeks, thanks for the question. After every 15 weeks, we expect to do um, a recital of sort. Uh, it would, of course, we have theater, dance, and then the boat building program. Uh, now, the boat building program uh, has programs here in Virginia Beach, but um, the headquarters for the folks who, the, the warehouse, um, is where most of the courses would be held unless we can get a location to actually do boat building every week here. And we've been working on that. Well, I'm really excited, so make sure I know about when your recital is, because I want to see what these young people do. Thank yes. you. Yeah, oh, yes. Enough. Yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you for being Hi. here, Dr. Harris. Council Thank you, Councilmember Rouse, for bringing the presentation forward for our agenda today. And I'd just like to say I'm very excited about the program. Um, I certainly, I know your work. You. you do good work in the community. Thank Congratulations you. on um, being promoted recently um, to the, the recent position that you were promoted to. I saw Thank that, you. and I've Thank been kind of watching. So uh, oftentimes when you're promoted, in those positions, that means your work makes a difference. So thank you for your work in the community. I appreciate that. Your program speaks to me because it's about youth. 
Yes. And so you have my attention and you have my support for this program. Um, oftentimes we always talk about helping our youth. And this is an engaging program that will, I believe, invest in our youth, sustain our youth, help our youth. Uh, and I believe the funding that you're requesting, that's not a lot of money. I think that's uh, a, a, a minimal ask for a huge investment in our community, in our youth, and in the future. Uh, and so I'm certainly very supportive of it. And it also speaks to the point that was raised once before, and I talk about it often. The community, you have the programs. You have the ideas. Now it's on city council. Uh, it's on our elected officials to provide the resources and the funding you need. That is an essential collaboration that we must do and that we must commit to if we want to see a change within our community. If we want to see gun violence or, excuse me, um, youth violence and different things uh, be decreased, uh, we need to see more <coughs> programs like this. We need to see more community leaders like yourself coming forward with <coughs> capable ideas, investing in our youth, and then city council and, and leaders need to step up and provide the resources and funding. So I certainly support what you're doing. Um, my question for you is the, the ask, the 25,000, mm -hmm. is, is this going to be a recurring ask or just for um, your pilot program or this particular program? Thank you for the question. Uh, it would be a, it, I would need to come back as we are successful. Uh, I recognize this being a, uh, a new program in the area that there may, as I said, our budget for the year, that's three okay. cycles of 15 weeks at 50, at 50,000. Mm -hmm. um, if the council wants to support 50,000, that's great. But what I'm trying to do is because I am, um, my background is education, as you know, so outcomes are important for me. So the, the role of recruiting, getting students, and getting the outcomes to prove the success of the program, I'm very aware of that, that um, that's a reasonable expectation. Mm -hmm. So when I say 50, 000, 25,000, mm -hmm. I need that to even get started. Okay. Uh, so, so to answer your question in short, yes, it, if we're successful, I'll be back. All right, so just thinking ahead, planning for the future, uh -huh. to know what I need to support and ask for and uh -huh. advocate for in the future. Thank you. Thank you for and your Thank work. you for your support and you the important work you do as well. Yes, sir. And Michael, and don't you own a series of shops throughout the region, Michael? Uh, you know. <laughs> I wish I did. <laughs> um, or do I? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, well, thank you, Dr. Harris, for being here. It's, um, it's good to see you again. We did have a great conversation about the program, and thanks for coming back to share more. Uh, obviously, the arts are um, something that's very important to me, um, and, I, and I, because I know that they're vital to our community and to the um, vitality and health of our community. A lot of people who are young don't have access to the arts um, until they become adults. And they only develop a love for the arts because of exposure they've had in a period of time when, when we were growing up. And that was definitely true for me during my visits to the Chrysler Museum of Art when I was in school and where I now work and have had en enjoyed a long um, love and relationship with museums. and. Um, and the arts as part of my life as a result to exposure as a young person. So I think what you're doing is critically important. Um, and it's definitely uh, something that I would like to support. Um, I do want to ask you, uh, I'm also the liaison to the Arts and Humanities Commission, mm -hmm. which is currently um, entering a, um, a process where they award grants. So I guess my question for you is, have you applied for an Arts and Humanities Commission grant? I have not. You haven't? Um, not yet. Uh, you, I think that's something you mentioned to me when we chatted about it. Uh, and I, I don't know if the cycle has started yet. Yeah, and in fact, I think the deadline for, for, the, for the grant applications has already passed, um, <coughs> which isn't disqualifying for, for your um, request. I think that there are uh, opportunities where it makes a lot of sense for um, the Arts and Humanities Commission to consider requests uh, and, and to go through that process. And there are some times when the city council, uh, it, you know, can um, can award grants independently of the Arts and Humanities Commission. Um, I do think it's good since we have a process in place. It's not, it would, it's too late for this year. So I, I think it's appropriately 
um, being requested of you now, which, which makes a lot of sense. But I do think that there's two things I like to say. One is there is a process by which the city awards grants to arts organizations, and that's through the Arts and Humanities Commission. And to the greatest extent possible, I think it's important that we adhere to that process. Um, and, and then number two, I think one of the challenges that we have as a city is that uh, I don't know that they would have um, enough resources to fund your request uh, on the basis of the volume of requests that come in relative to the resources they have to distribute. So I'm using your request, which I think is meritorious and I fully support, um, to also illustrate what I think is a need for additional resources for the Arts and Humanities Commission to not only, because there are so many wonderful arts organizations in Virginia Beach, and I think we should um, do everything we can to attempt to support all of them, at least through a competitive process. So I think um, I'm just using this as an opportunity to suggest that we should consider providing additional resources because the work that you do and the work that arts organizations do to serve young people, to serve um, adults, and to serve seniors as well um, is invaluable. You can't put a price tag on it. It's an investment in our community, and I think um, we should um, consider in a responsible fashion every reasonable opportunity we can to make that investment. So thank you very much. Thank Those you. are my comments. Anyone else? Barbara? Right. Well, I guess my question is more for the city manager. Um, we just have got this proposed budget today, so we're already looking at maybe uh, chopping it up before we even open the, the, the uh, lid to it here. Uh, but I guess this would come under the non-departmental resource summary, and I'm looking here at, at this list that's grown over the years, and I think what Michael was, one of them you were referring to was the community organization grant, which has a process. But, you know, if we've deviated from that process so many times, we might want to re-examine that and not make those folks jump through the hoops they have to jump through if it's going to be a direct city council award. So I, I really think we might need to look at this process as a part of the budget and see where we are with it and what the right thing is. You were talking about arts and humanities grants, but the COEG grants, we have an appointed committee that allocates that. So I really think we need to look at this whole process and see where we are with it because coming in one at the time sort of destroys that process. And if we're going to do it this way instead of that way, we need to not make those organizations jump through the hoops. So anyway, if this could be brought to us as a part of the budget, I think that's the place for it to be. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Go ahead. Uh, I would just say I, my uh, wife, Judge Tower, is a former board member of communities and schools and a big supporter, and also now on the Arts and Humanities Commission. I would just echo my concerns as she is currently involved with a pile of uh, requests on her desk and has been holed up there for a couple of days, and I think it's got another couple of days this week reading, reading requests for that is we really do need to reconcile these processes uh, probably better than we have, and, and I would be supportive of trying to do that as well. I want to express my support, complete support, particularly for the dance program. I have a granddaughter who is, uh, who is going, just been admitted to the North Carolina School for the Arts, which I'm, she's very pleased about, and so am I, and she's a dancer. and uh, and. And I remember the days when some of my uh, children, who are now quite advanced, um, learned under uh, Mr. Watson. He he was my favorite favorite teacher at Norfolk Academy. Always uh, adults who extend themselves to make children aware of and feel like they can be a part of the arts always have a special place. So thank you for all you're doing in that regard. Thank you. Anyone else? Anipis, let me just say, and knowing you uh, for so long, I know what a noble and great person you are, what a dedicated person you are, what a man of faith you are. And in a very troubled world, we need solutions. We need paths. Um, you know, it's, it's no mystery that, you know, especially recently we had a, a, 
a rash, an epidemic of youth violence in, not in, in the region and throughout this country. And to properly address it, we have to do a number of things in organizations like that. And uh, Ms. Wooten, if you don't mind me sharing, yesterday we had a, a meeting with three remarkable young men talking about Juneteenth and offering different types of activities. I think, if anything, uh, something in the waterproof, when we give youth and other people things to do, you know, it's a good thing. And uh, that being said, um, uh, we're convening. Uh, if we're going to confront youth violence, we have to look at the whole picture. And we have to find constructive avenues for young folks of all races, ages, you know, religions, and everything. Give them something meaningful to do. Um, we're convening the, uh, I had the opportunity to speak to the mayors of the 757 yesterday, and we're going to be convening hopefully next week with our city managers and police chiefs to get into a discussion. And a lot of this discussion, and you know, the, um, Mayor Tuck from uh, Hampton, uh, you know, brought up the fact that we may have to do, and I think he was talking about programs like yours, but, and uh, like even Chief Newdigate said, you know, the problem doesn't stop at anybody's border. Yeah. And, you know, we got to deal with it collectively. And so, you know, we're going to come together, and I think, you know, part of the things we're going to look at is uh, solutions <coughs> are activities and, you know, make our oceanfront a destination for everyone, make our city a destination for everyone. Um, you know, the Vice Mayor Wilson is going to be uh, – getting going our own Virginia Beach initiative on youth violence going forward, bringing community activities here, but then we're going to be working with the other uh, localities. So even, you know, your, what you're offering, I think it could be generic and appropriate, uh, you know, for the other cities too. Once, once, once you, any new program you get, you got to get it up, got to debug and everything. You know, Anapis, this could be a template, you know, you know, for the rest of the nation on, you know, how to get youth engaged and bring out the talents in them. And, uh, you know, we just can't fill the weekend at, uh, or two at a time. This has to be part of the culture of Virginia Beach. So I applaud you, and, uh, you know, it's a path forward. Okay, thank you, and God bless you, brother. Oh, thank you. And thank you, Council. Thank you. Actually, I see in here that the grant applications for the COEG program is through the last week of March, so there's still time. Okay, there we go. We, there's a possibility. We're, let me put it this way. Uh, you, you give the solutions, and uh, it's up to us, uh, I think as Sabrina said, to find the pathways, okay? But thank you so much. All right, now we are privileged to have a friend of Virginia Beach, uh, Dr. Scott Miller from Virginia Wesleyan. Welcome, Scott. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. Virginia Wesleyan is uh, proud to be the oldest university in Virginia Beach. And, you know, let me remind you, as a matter of fact, that we are one of only two nonprofit universities that claim Virginia Beach as our home. So we are extremely proud of that. Starting in March of 2020 and continuing <coughs> through the darkest times of the pandemic, Virginia Wesleyan attracted a good bit of media attention for our non-credit programs offered through VWU Global Campus. These courses and programs were directed at helping people that were negatively impacted by the pandemic. They were furloughed, laid off, and even in a number of cases, retrenched. I want to thank the City of Virginia Beach, the City Manager, Patrick Duhaney, Deputy City Manager, Director of Economic Development, Taylor Adams, and the Hampton Roads Workforce Council for their wisdom, foresight, and partnership on this program that has benefited so many. Before I comment on this program, please allow me to take a moment to express gratitude on a different front. 
Last week, I attended a gathering of business leaders for the Board of Directors planning retreat for Virginia Beach Vision. Last night, I attended a gathering of about 30 business leaders at Aldo's. At both meetings, I heard tremendous appreciation for the good work of our city manager and his deputy city manager at creating a new, more user-friendly service atmosphere for the city of Virginia Beach. Having completed 31 construction projects at our campus during the past six years, I've observed some of the obstacles and frustrations of the past. So I have a special appreciation for the spirit of cooperation that they've brought to their roles. Patrick and Taylor have brought a freshness to operations that's very much needed and appreciated by the business community. And on behalf of the community, I say thank you. Uh, two weeks ago, as Virginia Wesleyan University brought two construction projects to a close, I received an unsolicited call from a city department head asking for input on the city's role in both projects. After a good constructive conversation, I asked what prompted the call. He <coughs> cited the new philosophy of user friendliness espoused by both Patrick and Taylor. So Patrick and Taylor, I thank you. We all thank you. I hope the spirit of cooperation permeates all areas and services in the city. Thank you for those comments. Now, back to the topic at hand. The Virginia Beach Economic Development, Virginia Wesleyan University Workforce Development Program offers courses online, in person, on site at area businesses, and at the Hive in town center. Since March of 2020, over 9,000 300 learners have registered for these non-credit courses with 2,411 completions and certificates. 72% of the registrants, that's 6,696, list Virginia Beach as their home. The online offerings became particularly attractive during the period of the governor's stay-at-home order in 2020. In fact, we had one individual that took 19 different courses. Um, he said it kept him sane. <laughs> the impact of these courses cannot be overstated. Offered free of charge for learners, these courses provided community members a way to learn new skills or advance existing skills in the face of unemployment due to the pandemic. Among the most popular ones were the courses on cover letter and resume writing, personal finance, administrative assistant fundamentals, creating personal web pages, introduction to Excel and Word, and the like. For many learners, it was a, a way to remain professionally relevant during a very challenging time. These courses allowed our greater community not only a risk-free way to garner new skills, but to come out of the pandemic stronger and more resilient. <laughs> Those that completed online courses were offered additional online training in the same or corresponding track as the workforce development course demonstrating VWU's commitment to lifelong learning and continuing education for the region's workforce and beyond. An offshoot of the early success of the program has been the addition of corporate training and workforce development programs with a menu of options in area businesses. An important part of our partnership has been our ability to use the Hive in town center. We are proud to host the spring student designed and led Marlin Business Conference opening session at the Hive on April the 11th. We welcome John Pruden, the CEO of Taste, as the keynote speaker that evening. Other conference speakers selected by the students include Delcino Miles, president and CEO of the Miles Agency, Priscilla Monti, Senior Vice President for Programs and Communications at the Hampton Roads Chamber of Commerce, and Linda Peck, Executive Director of the Greater Norfolk Corporation. The Hive also boasts Virginia Wesleyan University interns who help with the daily operations of the facilities and special events. This workforce development program has attracted the attention of Senators Tim Kaine and Mark Warner who supplemented the city funding with a joint request of $800,000 to support a COVID-19 displaced worker initiative for people who've been laid off, furloughed, and have lost their jobs. I'm proud to share that the funding has been approved for the 2022 budget. 
this program was one of only two projects statewide requested and endorsed by Senators Kane and Warner. Uh, with me today, over my left shoulder to the midway back in the room, is Larry Belcher. He is the Director of Enrollment for VWU Global Campus, which includes all of our non-credit courses, our lifelong learning program, our early enrollment program, and our joint campus that we operate in Tokyo, Japan. So again, I offer my special thanks to the City of Virginia Beach for supporting this program and allowing me to share some of the highlights of the program today. We look forward to continuing our partnership to create a resilient and future-oriented workforce in coastal Virginia. So I thank you, and are there any questions any for questions? me? Yeah, Barbara. My, uh, not at all professional, but just everyday common sense kind of thought is that particularly after listening to uh, the economists at the uh, planning district last week and the extremely large number of people who have simply left the workforce mm -hmm. uh, through this, this uh, time and our inability to fill vacancies, particularly in some areas such as our community services, boards, uh, programs, it, it's, it seems to me that what we've got to do is a lot of job training with our, our youth or people who are looking for changing their whole focus in their jobs. Is that what you're all about? That's, that's a lot of it, yes. Um, we did see during the statewide shutdown the highest percentage of people were furloughed and did not expect to come back to a job. So they were looking to, they had been in those positions for a long time, they were looking to refine their skills so that when they came out of it, they would be able to do something new that would be, um, make them more marketable. Um, you know, we are seeing at Virginia Wesleyan a number of people who are coming back to us wanting a degree or studies in entirely unrelated areas to their backgrounds as a retooling for something else. Um, you know, when I became president at Virginia Wesleyan in 2015, we were a very traditional residential liberal arts college and the board asked me to think outside the box and even throw the box away. That resulted in our non-credit program, our evening and weekend program, our international campus in Japan. We want to be cradle-to-grave education. We want to be responsive to early enrollment students, but we also want to be result to, to mid-career individuals who are looking to do something different. I think it's got to be a lot of job training mm -hmm. uh, I, for whatever reason, people decided to leave the occupations they had and whether they ever intend to come back or not, it just seems that that's where the opportunities are and it's going to take a while, but... So we use data analytics to look at what classes would be the most popular among those who, are, who have the highest need and it has led us to craft classes in a particular variety that would help them. We also have a solid relationship through the Hive with Sean Avery and Hampton Roads Workforce Council and um, get lists, get referrals, and also look at what some of the information is that's trending with them at all also in order to determine what offerings would be the most beneficial to our campus, to our community as a whole. I think this is the right track. Thank you. And, and, and I thank you for the, the, the wisdom that your economic development office had to partner with us on it. Yeah, Aaron. Thank you, uh, uh, President Miller. Um, just wanted to take this, this time, and I know I have the opportunity to do it tomorrow, um, just to commend you on thinking outside of the box, but also being a partner and engaging our youth, um, particularly at a, at a very early age um, in their in K-12 education. Um, tomorrow, Dr. Miller, President Miller, uh, and Virginia Wesleyan will be a part of um, our Student Workforce Development Forum, um, basically sponsored by Sean Avery and the Workforce Council. And this is an opportunity from you know Mr. Miller and other uh, Tatworth Community College, as well as Norfolk um, Academy, Norfolk uh, uh, Cape Henry Academy, Norfolk Norfolk Academy, Kentsville, um, get a chance to listen to our students and figure out, you know, stop that brain drain, figure out from them exactly what they're looking for um, in order to stay in Hampton Roads and what jobs and what other options are available here. And I just want to take this time and, and thank you for being a, a partner in that and, and always being proactive. Um, since I've, I've met you, you've always been on the, 
on the cuffs of figuring out, uh, you know, what are the trends, what's coming, how do we stay ahead, and, and always looking forward. And so I just want to thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sabrina, and then Gar. Good afternoon, Dr. Miller. Thank you so much for your report. Very informative. Thanks. Um, I like to try to pride myself on making sure that I stay informed about programs that help our community and uplift our community. And you're, you're doing that work. Your university is doing that work. Your staff is doing that work. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. For your investment in our community. And I've been writing down some information, especially the information for the business community. That's valuable. Uh, that's a valuable resource. Correct. And I will certainly help you get the word out on a lot of those mm -hmm. programs because I'm always in communication with business owners and they always ask me about resources uh, and what can be helpful. So I just want to say thank you and congratulations on the $800,000 grant. Thank you. Very impressive. Yeah, the senators were very much impressed by the program that we established in partnership with you and they wanted to make it available to a broader audience and wanted to provide uh, some of the technical and learning resources support, equipment and the like, that would give learners in this program, um, you know, state-of-the-art resources to support them in their transition skills. But, you know, I, I want to underscore again, my, my predecessors didn't often say this enough. Um, you know, we are the oldest school in Virginia Beach. We are your university. We're a private institution, so we're not a state school. So you don't see us on television championing the state agenda all the time. But we are yours, and we are here to serve your population. So if you have small businesses that you're talking to, the reason that I brought Larry with me is so that you would see who he is, because he is our partnership director. And um, he offers a variety of on-site courses and programs for businesses throughout Virginia Beach. Excellent. And we're there to help craft uh, programs to help all walks of life around here. Wonderful. So we appreciate that. Very impressive. Thank you. Guy. I just uh, would echo the comments of uh, my friends, Mr. Rouse and Ms. Wooten, uh, about what a valuable asset Virginia Wesleyan has been. And I want to just express my personal belief that it's largely due to the leadership of President Miller, which I Thank think you. has been extraordinary. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for what you've done for our residents and, and for the city management as well. I know we all depend on you for advice and guidance on what's going on in the educational field and hope to be able to continue to do that. It's been a great partnership. Thank you. Uh, certainly, I've been aware of it from, uh, from the time I came on council, and I've been lucky enough to have one good friend on the, on the Wesleyan board during that time. Uh, I know she shares the appreciation for you and your staff. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, anyone else? Scott, I just want to personally thank you. And thank you. let me tell you, Virginia Wesleyan is in some ways a hidden jewel in Virginia Beach. Not only do you got a gorgeous campus full of green, but I've, I've had the opportunity to do a couple guest lectures mm -hmm. in your classroom. There is a spirit about the place that is second to none. And I think what you're doing is underscoring, um, you know, kind of a little bit of a paradigm shift in our government with the city manager and Taylor and, you know, a council that are coming together and appreciating the collaborations that it takes to have us take Virginia Beach to the next level. You know, we are on the cusp of bringing in some significant investment in businesses and technology. And unless we have a trained workforce, it's, it's going to be all for naught. And let me just say, you know, you are helping build the bridge to fill that gap in a most notable way. But, but once again, I appreciate your comments on the planning department. Once again, we're striving to be that city of yes. And, uh, you know, and then by talking to folks that, that have been through, uh, let's just call the barriers to success, uh, you know, so we could get rid of them is most helpful. But you're a friend, you're a partner, Thank you. you are and always will be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. Dr. Miller, I got a question asking for a friend. Is, uh, is, <laughs> asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, 
football on the horizon, and you no. can plead the fifth if you need to. No. It's not on the horizon? No. Okay. I'd heard a rumor that football may be in the works over at Virginia Wesleyan. It uh, is not. Okay. Is that your <laughs> final answer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They've got a good sure. basketball team, though. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and, and you'll recall three of the last four national championships in women's softball have come back to Virginia Beach through Scott, our Scott, that was just an example and constituent response by a council. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank well, you all. I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Manager. Mr. Mayor, members of council at this time, the folks from our wonderful CVB is going to come and give council an update on our spring and summer campaign. Now, before you get going, okay. <laughs> let me say this about that. What a spectacular weekend we had at the oceanfront this Absolutely. weekend. Was it 25,000 runners? 25,000 runners. 25,000 runners. And not all of them were for... Virginia Beach. They stayed in our hotels, used our facilities and everything. But let me compliment the organization, the spirit. Uh, I'll tell you what, even the governor was at the uh, finish line for four hours welcoming the runners back. And Great. I'll tell you what, but you know, everybody I spoke to, uh, Mr. Manager, all the city staff that were there, and they were jazzed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll tell you what, you help set it you and your crew help set the tone but I just had to start with that. well thank you we'll definitely pass on the word and thank you very much to all of the council members that supported this weekend it was it was a great weekend so um, good afternoon mayor vice mayor members of council my name is Nancy Hellman and this is the first time that I'm formally presenting to you in my new capacity as the director of the Convention and Visitors Bureau thank you for your confidence in me I can assure you that our CVB team is working hard and excited about continuing our work as a year-round destination marketing organization. I'm pleased to be here today to share with you a brief update and look at our spring and summer campaign. With me today, I have our Vice President of Marketing and Communications, Lauren Townsend, Director of Administration, Michelle Boyette, and members of our marketing team. We are laser focused on capitalizing on the opportunity to create a positive return on investment. This presentation is designed to show you where we are, where we've been, and where we're going. To say that our team has been busy would be an understatement, but we're focused on the economic vitality of our destination and delivering on expectations that lead to long-term success coming out of the pandemic. Virginia Beach's recovery is well underway. During the summer of 2021 season, demand for overnight visitation surpassed 2020 numbers and even improved upon pre-pandemic 2019 peak performance, which was historically high for Virginia Beach. Average occupancy during the 2021 season largely remained in the 80% occupancy rate range with a RevPAR increase of approximately 20% over 2019 numbers. Similar to this previous year, there were several weeks during the 2021 summer season that Virginia Beach Norfolk DMA held the number one spot across the top 25 tourism destination markets nationwide. We're still riding the high of the announcement of Jackalope Virginia Beach at the recent Virginia Beach State of the City address, so thank you for that. This is one of the many events that we look forward to hosting in the months and years ahead. We've been working hard on a number of other new initiatives and programs, including the planning of the second annual VB Summit for October of 2022. Our, our inaugural event in 2021 was a huge success with keynote speaker Roger Dow, who is the president of U.S. Travel. Also in the works is the development of a tourism strategic plan and the research phase of the Economic Vitality Department Portfolio Rebranding Initiative. Coming out of COVID, we're thrilled to be welcoming back some of our signature events and festivals, which are celebrating major milestones this year. As the mayor mentioned, Shamrock Marathon had a massively successful 50th anniversary weekend. So thank you again to everybody who helped us participate. The North American Sand Soccer Championship will be welcoming 1,000 teams from around the world in its 29th event this June. ECSC celebrates its diamond anniversary this August, making it the longest running surf competition in the world. From the Neptune Festival to the air show, there will be many reasons to celebrate. 
I'm proud of our CVB team for continually striving for and attaining excellence within our industry. The CVB was awarded the Silver Magellan Award for its tourism marketing campaign for the 2021 season. This is a very prestigious award and no small feat. Our team tirelessly promotes our destination and helps secure major recognitions like being named one of the top 20 beach boardwalks in America by Reader's Digest, selected as one of the top 10 beach vacations for fall by USA Today, recognized as a city with a big time art scene by Condon Nast Traveler, and Virginia Beach being highlighted as the safest large city in America by Advisor Smith. This next slide highlights the American Travel Sentiment Survey that we've been following throughout the COVID pandemic. As you can see, we're well over the pre-pandemic um, rate for positive travel sentiment. So the bottom line is that we're at an all-time high. The next slide is encouraging as well. It shows the impact of travel planning due to COVID is at an all-time low. We believe that these forecasting graphs are showing that there's a path to normalcy within the leisure market. However, workforce continues to be a significant hurdle for our hospitality industry. The data on this slide shows that highly desired activities that travelers plan their vacation around are all located right here in Virginia Beach. So to get a clear understanding of our warm weather campaign, it's important to ground ourselves in where we've been during fall winter campaign because it leads into our spring summer campaign. As I've said before, it's a new day for tourism in Virginia Beach. And with that comes a shift in our mindset, how we think about our work and how we articulate it. As we know, words make a difference. As a year round destination, we no longer have a shoulder season. We promote cool weather experiences and warm weather experiences. And we no longer have tourists. We've taken it even further than visitors. We now think of our visitors as invited guests. So putting that into practice, coming into fall winter with our potential guests sat along a wide spectrum of mindsets. From the guests that were really ready to make up for lost time, like you see on the left, to the folks that were just ready to get out again but avoid the crowds. We needed to be able to communicate across the entire spectrum. Our team explored a number of ways to do that, include, including clever, disruptive approaches, but we always came back to the people. And when we say people, we mean our guests. But when we, also, when we say people, we also mean our amazing local community. As the mayor always says, the people of our community are what make Virginia Beach special. This is our competitive advantage. Virginia Beach never shuts down and the citizens of Virginia Beach live the life year round and are our best ambassadors. When we were rethinking our campaign with our shift in mindset, we knew that advertising is often impersonal. You know, someone trying to sell you something. But an invitation is personal, human and welcoming. So what better way than to enlist the help of our local ambassadors to extend an open invitation to our guests? We asked for help and the community showed up and showed out. This video sums up the Virginia Beach open invitation campaign for fall winter.
So we started with Virginia, the Virginia Beaches Open campaign. Literally, our beaches and our community were open coming out of COVID. We wanted to explore the idea of openness even further, and this led us to the Open Invitation campaign. This was brought to life across a number of placements, from digital to billboards to branded content to commercials. Our invitation was everywhere. And now it's time to take that even one step further. Collaborating closely with our Advertising Advisory Committee, we conducted several stakeholder input and idea sessions, including a campaign strategy workshop. And here are some of the insights that we used to help shape the direction of the spring-summer campaign. Basically, we knew we were on to something great. This feedback was overwhelming that we should continue down this path. So for spring-summer, we should involve the invitation that was extended in fall-winter and invite families to enjoy Virginia Beach. We know that spring summer is where we shine. So for spring summer, it's not just about who we are, it's about what we do. How we eat, how we drink, how we relax, play, and unplug. Essentially, how we live the life. This campaign will let real families of our community welcome guests and share in their experiences. Here's a quick peek at spring summer. This campaign will feature digital, paid social, email marketing, native ads, billboards, outdoor ads, television video units, and much more. So this slide um, is an example of where the markets are that we target and we show our creative all the creative that you just saw. And this is a bird's eye view of our seasonal campaigns. You will notice that we'll be rolling out our, our Leisure International campaign to Canada in the late spring, running through the end of the fiscal year simultaneously. Before I wrap, I wanted to extend a sincere thanks to the community members that participated in this campaign. A few of them are here today. Not only did they participate in the advertising, they actually became local guides, creating itineraries and highlighting all of their favorite activities to do in Virginia Beach. We'd also like to thank Malika Manuel, who is also here. <laughs> he was the artistic driving force behind the Open Invitation Campaign. So thank you very much to our team, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions or comments? Aaron. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Good to see you again. Good to see you, too. Um, I was just uh, noticing on uh, page six um, to in, at the bottom of the chart, where are we? And it says to uh, attend an amateur or professional sporting event. When they were getting, during the survey, um, and I know how well our sports center is doing, how does that uh, equate or correlate to our, um, our sports center? Because, and can you tell us about how well our sports center is actually doing. Yeah, so you know that's one of my favorite things to actually talk about. But um, our sports center opened in October of 2020, right in the height of the global pandemic, which as an event planner is probably um, one of your worst nightmares. But we had the hardest working team in the city of Virginia Beach, and we were able to operate events throughout the entire pandemic at whatever capacity we were allowed to. Mm -hmm. um, and to, we're also to the point now where just last weekend we had 6,000 people in the sports center with a full track meet on one side of the building and a volleyball event on another side of the building and a gymnastics event going on in the convention center. So sports tourism is definitely alive and well in Virginia Beach. And um, I think that if you ask some of our stakeholders, um, our hotel partners and our restaurant partners, they will tell you that sports tourism really kept the boat afloat during um, the, the COVID pandemic because it was one of the first to recover. So we're incredibly grateful. And um, thank you so much for the leadership and for the support in opening the Sports Center. If I could follow up, Mr. Mayor. Sure. How are we, how is the Sports Center looking this summer? And is that, you know, the, is that captured in this, um, in this survey? I'm, I'm not sure how they, they conducted the survey. but I've Yeah, so this survey was really done about traveler sentiment, okay. overall traveler sentiment, and how, what they think about when they're trying to dream about vacation planning. Okay. So sports and tourism um, definitely go hand in hand, sure. but I believe this slide speaks mostly to the athletic side of vacationing, okay. whether it's surfing or um, running or doing all the great things that you can do in Virginia Beach. Um, but the sports center is performing incredibly well now that it can be open to capacity. 
Um, I think in 2020, if my numbers don't um, fail me, we had about 42 events in 2020, and we're up to about 67 this year. So it's wow. it's just action packed. And I hope that if you have a moment, you'll come down and join us and check out some of the action. All right, thank you. And I guess my my last question, and this is probably not a question from you, probably a question, you know, just comment for this council. I think we're going to have to figure out parking at the uh, <laughs> <laughs> the hills in front pretty yes. soon. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it's it's one of those problems that's um, a, a great problem to have. It means business has returned, and we're excited to welcome everybody back. So thank you very much for your comments. Thank you, Aaron Guy. I was going to touch on that as well. Uh, thank you, Nancy, for your presentation. Thanks thank for the great job you and all your team thank you are much. doing. Uh, the Sports Center, even in the face of the pandemic, has been an enormous success. It's obviously extremely popular, both with groups coming in, which makes uh, all of our uh, hospitality industry's hearts go pity pat, but it's been a, a terrific for local residents. I was Absolutely. there for a uh, youth basketball game with one of my grandchildren the other day. Every court packed with volleyball players, basketball players, uh, parents, grandparents, referees, staff, uh, smooth operation. I mean, it. It's an it, even on an off week weekday night. There's a lot going on and a lot of people involved and active, uh, both enjoying the facilities and producing the kind of hospitality that makes people realize what a great operation we've got there. I I, I view it as a, certainly a great success, and uh, I've missed the last. I think advertising. I mean, looking forward to the next one, but this is a con this program is a continuation. This is this is not yep. something new, really. In a way, we've been right. working on this all during the pandemic and before, and the uh, professional help we've had with that, I think, has been uh, remarkably uh, well received. But also, the people on that committee, I want to commend them. They've they their input. Uh, has helped shape that program uh, to what it is. Uh, and I think that's the reason it's so good is because the people that know know the business have had a good, uh, had a hand in shaping it. And, um, and our residents have also had, I think the parking issue, we are, you know, it's the, we're, we're victims of our own success in that regard and, and victims of I think long overdue need for parking. I'm looking forward to Mr. Adams' presentation. I see from the schedule that we're going to get a, get him in front of us to talk about that soon. Having been to a few Civic League meetings in the Beach District, I can tell you the residents are ready, ready, ready to solve that problem um, sooner rather than later, and I, I I know we will. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you. Thank okay, you for your Barbara comments. Barbara, then the sports center, of course, is great. But before that, we had the academic or the athletic village out here at the yes. the A and all of those uh, amateur sports kinds of things. Is that still, or do they work together, or how is? Yes. So our everything coming out this way too. Yes. Yeah, so our sports tourism program is really a a year round program. Um, of the 60 events that I said were in the sports center, there's an additional 100 that take place all over the city, <coughs> whether it's at the Princess Anne Athletic Complex or the Field House or the Virginia Beach Tennis Center or the U.S. Field Hockey Regional Training Center. We have events everywhere, the Hampton Road Soccer Complex. Um, any, any weekend on any given day, you'll find the activity in Virginia Beach, so you're absolutely correct. The, the, it all goes hand in hand, and it's one large program. It markets together. Absolutely. That? Absolutely, and um, we're really fortunate in Virginia Beach to have so many different types of offerings. So when sports move inside, we have an opportunity for them to compete, and now they're transitioning outside, and they have opportunity to compete outside as well. Um, for example, the sport of field hockey, we hosted U.S. Field Hockey's um, indoor championship inside the sports center, and now that sport is moving outdoors, and the regional training center will be home to all of our field hockey activities. So. And we're really fortunate that we have a year-round sports tourism program that continues to deliver. So we thank you. We certainly do have a lot of restaurants up here at this, <laughs> and I guess they're all packed during the weekends. It's, it's you're absolutely right. <laughs> to, the, uh, to the business.
businesses in this area as well. Yes, I think that if you came down here on any given weekend, you would see lots of kids in uniform. Mm -hmm. <laughs> David Plymouth. Well, also, there's a couple hotels, I think, that are getting ready to be developed soon by TCC, which will add to the inventory, and that shows the importance of the Princess Anne complex in terms of uh, what it brings to sports. But when you look at our all of our inventory, and I'm so um, delighted that uh, our economic development team and tourism team are now looking at this as economic development opportunities. And we are very close to being like the top sports destination for participatory sports in the country. I mean, we are this close with the sports center and, and all these other facilities, plus the beach for sand soccer. Uh, there's no rest for the weary. On Thursday, a bunch of wrestlers are coming in town. Yeah. We have a huge wrestling tournament, so uh, that parking might be a problem. Although, uh, we did purchase a piece of property on Virginia Beach Boulevard that once we close, I hope we can look at that as temporary parking as an interim use until we uh, get the ultimate use for that piece of property. Getting back to your campaign, I'm really glad we're beyond we're open yep. and on to this invitation idea. I think it's great that we treat our uh, visitors as customers and guests. I think that's a great concept. I think that will go over well with people. And also that you're getting back into the Canadian market. That's yes. a market that went away for two years. But there was a time in Virginia Beach where in July or August you'd go to a grocery store near the ocean front and you'd hear as much French being spoken as English. And I hope we can get back to that with the campaign that you're going to pull off. So. I think you guys are right on target and keep working. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, anybody else? Sabrina? Hi, good afternoon. Hi, good Ms. afternoon. Holman. Congratulations on your promotion. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I wanted to, and, and I actually like how you changed the messaging to invited guests. I think that's very unique. I think that will have a, a very a huge impact. Thank um, you. I have a question, though, about the facilities over in Landstown, the yes. athletic complex there. Do we have any plans of incorporating uh, that facility in terms of branding and, um, I guess, also letting our invited guests and others know mm -hmm. that we have that facility? Uh, and. I'm sure people, I know people are using it because it's always full. But I'm just wondering about branding all of it together. Yes. If, that, if that's a part of our strategy going forward. So that's definitely been discussed and um, as looking at our athletic um, facilities in the Princess Anne Commons area as, as one total package. So that is something we're looking into in the background. Um, and to answer your question about marketing, we have a, a very detailed marketing program for our business units, and one of our business units is sports tourism. Mm -hmm. So advertising for our program overall, whether it's indoor, outdoor, soccer, lacrosse, gymnastics, wrestling, we love them all. We love them all equally. And so um, we do have a, a really large program that we, um, we advertise to events rights holders around the country, and our team goes to meet with um, events rights holders at trade shows, conventions, wherever they are to sell Virginia Beach and bring those guests to us. Okay, wonderful. Thank you again. But I'll keep you posted as the brands Thank come you. together. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else at this point? Taylor has something to share, I think. Nope, just here. <laughs> uh, Nancy, Taylor, yes. or, uh, you know, what a remarkable crew you got. I mean, what a spirit of positivity you're bringing to everything. And I can't underscore. Uh, a score uh, two things. Number one, us going to a year-round destination. What a game changer that's going to be for the city. Uh, we're also getting more permanent <coughs> residents and condos out there, which are going to help, uh, you know, just with business in general. But, you know, the impact of the sports center, I think, is felt all the way up to 42nd Street. Uh, you know, from uh, what we've been told, and I was conferring with Linwood, that, you know, uh, perhaps the hotels had their best summer ever. But, you know, one thing, is, you know, when we talk about tenacity and the resiliency and how a city council and how a management team response was actually two years ago, when we were pretty much the only open beach. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, granted, a, a lot of places didn't have a great year, but at least they had something that kept them floating. You know, it was like being caught in a riptide. You just kind of tread water until you can make it to the beach. But the one action that we took as a council that did not seem significant at the time was when we were told that we could open the patios. And if you remember, we expedited as a council. We found out about a Tuesday. We voted on a Thursday. That Friday, there were people sitting outside in restaurants. And then once we got the beaches open, even though it was limited, and we deferred some advertising money, mm -hmm. people were coming and used Virginia Beach as a safe haven, you know, during probably the most traumatic times of families were able to come here just to get away, be on a beach and everything. And that launched into the following year where we successfully uh, requested that the governor open up a Memorial Day. We had a surf competition, sand soccer came, uh, Gov Governor Northen came and during a press conference mm -hmm. announced that uh, the sur uh, surf, and I think, it, and then we found out that this was perhaps the, uh, they had the best summer in history maybe or along that line. So kudos to you folks for having the tenacity and the vision and uh, you know for getting us through one of the toughest times in the city's history. Take a lot of credit for that. Thank you, but I'll defer all the credit to our amazing marketing team. They're the best. So Great. thank you, you guys very much. Were like Larry the Cable got get it done. <laughs> <laughs> Good That's stuff. That's right. Thank you. All right, next up Mr. Mayor, members of council, at this time, our planning director is going to give you a brief glimpse of the items that will come before you at our next council meeting from a planning standpoint. Hey, Bobby, how you doing? Good, sir. How are you? Manager, thank you. Mayor, uh, members of city council. The quick overview of the planning items that will be that are scheduled for uh, April 5th uh, due to a uh, light agenda on the Planning Commission. The April 19th uh, City Council meeting does not have any current uh, planning items scheduled on it. Uh, these five items include an amendment to the zoning ordinance related to uh, battery storage facilities. Starting with item one, we have a zoning ordinance text amendment to amend section 111 of the city zoning ordinance to add terms related to energy storage facilities, uh, as well as add uh, the use into the use table and by conditional use permit in the I-1 and I-2 zoning districts. Madam Vice Mayor, if I could. Oh, I, no, I, I didn't see in the analysis, because you know all these are probably either lithium ion or lithium cobalt or some other kind of derivative battery but if an event there is a fire, those things are catastrophic in the heat they produce. And it didn't, I didn't see in there where that was taken into account in the ordinance and the requirement. So I would just like to know a little bit about how we assess the fire danger of those kind of facilities and, you know, how that's addressed. Yes, sir. That, the construction of those facilities that's typical for the... Um, for the industry was provided to us, which includes self-sufficient fire suppression systems in each of the batteries. Uh, but we will provide we will provide that additional information, well, yes, sir. When you say that each of the batteries, but when you concentrate the number of batteries in a place, it's not the same as saying the individual batteries because once you get a failure in one place and start, you're talking about a, a critical. I'm just curious how they account for that that failure. The systems yes, are great. But if you take the reliability of every system and keep multiplying it, the reliability on the aggregate goes down. And so how do they just, what is that? Is it distance? You know, you, it takes tremendous amount of water to put out a lithium fire. I'm just curious how they accounted for that. Yes, sir. Understood. Part of the zoning ordinance text amendment is first to define the energy storage facility as well as a decommissioning plan which will be a requirement for any approval of these energy storage facilities. These energy storage facilities are used to supplement the uh, offshore wind and other renewable energies that, that are needed uh, and are needed in order to, to sustain the grid. 
So the energy that comes in from the offshore or potentially any solar uh, would be stored at these locations and then, and then utilized uh, in the grid moving forward. Right now, the proposal is, uh, as it was recommended by the Planning Commission, was a conditional use permit in the I-1 and I-2 zoning districts uh, to operate one of these energy storage facilities. I have a question here, too, if I could. Yes, John. I noticed that two of those places are the military installations. Are they subject to our regulations? No, sir. They, that is just the blanket zoning that's on those okay. areas. Very good. Check. Thank you. Yes, sir. The additional standards that are also proposed, uh, in addition to the conditional use permit, are 100-foot setbacks along the lot lines, additional uh, landscape screening, which includes fencing, and also the decommissioning plan, uh, which is required and complete a uh, required a complete physical removal within 365 days of abandonment. Uh, similar to other renewable energy sources, uh, it, uh, there is concern of it just being left in that state, and so that was an important part of the of the removal of that. If uh, if that if the proposed battery uh, use um, is to be abandoned and they are required to the property owner is required to remove and clear the site according to the decommissioning plan provided item number two is by baker road properties llc in district four at 1276 baker road it's a conditional rezoning from i1 industrial district to conditional a36 apartment district Staff recommended approval and the Planning Commission on 11 to 0 vote recommended approval. Mr. Mayor, if I could. Yeah, John. Just as a point of observation, you know, we've talked about this a lot, so is my colleague, Councilmember Branch, about we don't have any more land. You may recall I made this point on the Greenwich Road rezoning. We did I-1 to 836. Uh, I did confirm that the Economic Development Department was never consulted about whether this was a good idea or not relative to our inventory. This is four and a half acres larger than Atlantic Park. And I think that we have to think more strategically. Maybe this is the right answer, but I think we need to hear uh, from, from Mr. Taylor or someone before we get too far ahead of this and make sure we're making the right choice in light of the things we've commented about, not enough land. We have no shortage of residential property, but we have a shortage of property we can commercially develop and this is 14 point, I think 14 and a half acres roughly, and I think we ought to make sure we take that into consideration, and I hope Mr. Manager will get some assessment on that in our packet. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. The proposal is, again, to re rezone to conditional A36 for up to 524 multifamily units. Uh, this is the site of, a, of the defunct DLH sports complex that was never actually completed. Uh, the proposed plan uh, is designed in accordance with the Burton Station Strategic Growth Area Plan and integrates the development guidelines for multifamily residential development called for in the Comprehensive Plan Special Area Development Guidelines for area for Urban Development. Rosemary. Bobby, that's been sitting there unfinished for how many years? Do you have any idea? Um, I believe, uh, I'm running off of memory at this point, the... I believe it was at least 10 years at this point. It's been a terrible eyesore sitting there. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. There's a lot of eyesores over there. The applicant is proposing two uh, four-story buildings that, again, are in compliance with the SGA plan, uh, showing a number of amenities as well as structured parking as well as uh, uh, flat, flat lot parking provided uh, to meet the parking requirements. I'm sorry. Item number three is by North Independence LLC, uh, again, Council District 9 at 1612 Independence Boulevard. <coughs> the applicant is requesting conditional use permit for a mini warehouse. Staff recommends approval, and the Planning Commission voted 9 to 2 to recommend approval. The site is a 1.3 acre parcel zone B2, formerly a Wells Fargo Bank, and they're proposing to, to replace that building with a mini storage facility. This is the same size as the one on Northampton Boulevard, do you know? I do not know if the sizes are somewhere. I will have to review that, sir. Um, they, I've had uh, 
several inquiries from people who live in the apart in the I guess you'd call them townhouses. Yes, sir. In the back of this property, and number one, they're concerned about the drainage that's coming off of the the lot there. Uh, that we that goes into I guess it's a ditch, a drainage ditch that comes back behind those those condos and behind this property. Uh, do you have any insight as to what's being done about that? Our understanding is the existing parking lot that's there drains towards the back of the property. Um, I believe that we have provided, uh, I'll need to double check to see if we've had anyone uh, provide any complaints or that we've had anyone send out an inspector to take a look at that. So, um, but yes, we did hear that same complaint as well. How many units are there? Do you know? Uh, it's a townhouse community that is located behind it. Uh, you, you can. Know, I'm talking about the storage. Oh, the storage units? How many units are there? I only have it in square footage, sir. I don't know how many individual storage units are located in there. Okay. Well, I've. I've seen some of the other I went and visited some of the other units that this developer has uh, developed and they're pretty big units so I'm concerned about the size in relation to the property there we'll have that for the for their general request mr. Jones yeah, drop. Will we get the letters of opposition, the petition in our packet? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Uh, to reduce the potential for light uh, spillage onto the adjacent townhome properties, conditions are, have been recommended by the Planning Commission that prohibit external lights at the rear of the building except for those fixtures directed downward over the fire exits. Um, and those the fixtures will only be motion activated and no more than 10 feet in height along the northeastern property line abutting the apartment district where the townhouses are located. The applicant has initially proposed that they would have two entry points on Independence Boulevard. Staff with the Planning Commission's concurrence recommends that one of these uh, access points be closed to limit potential conflicts with Independence Boulevard, which we know is a highly traveled uh, road. Again, staff recommends approval. And the Planning Commission on a 9 to 2 vote recommends approval. Item number four is a short term rental. Uh, staff recommends approval, and the Planning Commission on a 10 to 0 vote with one abstention recommends approval. Now, this is a one bedroom unit in the Ocean's Two condominium at the north, northern terminus of the boardwalk at 40th and Pacific. You've seen a number of these requests that have come forward for this location. Uh, we did receive a letter of opposition. Uh, Two letters of opposition were received, uh, citing concerns over a concentration of short-term rentals. Uh, one of those uh, letters came from someone that was operating a short-term rental. <laughs> and the last item, item number five, is also a short-term rental, a two-bedroom unit uh, located at the retreat by the C condominium at 9th Street and Pacific. 10 to 0 vote with one abstention. The Planning Commission recommends approval. Uh, they do have one parking space located on site. The second parking space is located, if necessary, at the 9th Street parking garage with an agreement with the city. And that, that is the end of the planning glimpse. Sorry. Thank you, Bobby. Uh, uh, questions about short term rentals. Um, could you, maybe you've got this on your schedule, maybe, but uh, could you give us kind of a preview of what's going on with short-term rentals in terms of what uh, your staff is doing to get ready for the season, so to speak? Uh, I had that question at a couple of Civic League meetings, um, and I didn't have a ready answer for a couple of questions, One specific questions. One was, when are the signs due up? When are, they, when are short-term rental owners required to have those signs or maybe they already are but could you just comment on that and then just generally on what you're doing to prepare for the 
uh, short-term rental season. I might just comment as an aside and just FYI, I continue to get some questions about the short-term rental uh, operation on uh, Mediterranean Avenue on the north side of uh, uh, Virginia Beach Junior Middle School, Virginia Beach Middle School, um, in terms of overflow parking really is the main issue, although there may be some noise issues there, if you could just make a note of that. Yes, but sir. if you just generally comment on, on enforcement in the season, and which I know you guys are busy getting ready for that, but I just thought while I got you, if you could just tell, tell us all what you're doing. Yes, sir, and if it's the will of the council, it can come back with a presentation as well, just to, just to summarize. Uh, the signs are needed at when they begin to operate as a short-term rental. So, so if they're operating, they should have now, they should have their signs up now. Correct, right? yes, sir. And, and just for the purpose of anyone watching, and if, it, if, if people are aware of short-term rentals operating without signs or, or, or any other deficiencies in terms of what they think short-term rental op operators are doing, what should they do about it? So uh, for the after hours with any potential noise violations or other things, it would be to contact 311 so that we can check to see if they're on the list and we can have them contact the, um, the operator or the, the contact person to, to contact them. Of course, if it's a life safety issue, dealing with a, a rally party or something like that, that's something that needs to be handled by the police. If it's other uh, zoning related issues, they can contact the zoning office at um, www.vbgov.com slash str. There's an email address, str at vbgov.com, or the phone number that goes to our third party that will also send us the audio of that uh, as they log the complaints uh, from the person that calls it in. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Anybody else for Bobby? Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Colleagues, the time has come. It's what we've all been waiting for. <laughs> okay, our favorite time of year. All right, Kevin, welcome. <coughs> Mayor, Mayor, members of council, thanks for yes. having me. Before we get started, oh yeah, I, and John, I'm, I'm go ahead, sorry. go first. Before we get started, I want to just say that I am an employee of the Virginia Beach Sheriff's Office, and I've filed a disclosure letter with the city clerk. Okay, thank you, John. The good news is the school board budget is part of a larger budget, so I can talk to it. <clears throat> and likewise, I have filed a disclosure that my wife is a school teacher, and I can assure you that will not influence my judgment. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, anybody else? Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Members of Council, today I'm going to be briefing and presenting to you the city and the viewing public the city manager's proposed FY22 uh, operating budget and CIP. Um, you might notice that the budget documents in front of you this year look a little bit different than the previous years. It's because we ran closer to the print deadline than we ever have in my entire 14 year career here with the city. Uh, so, with that being said, I'd be. Um, a bad person if I did not take a moment to acknowledge my staff and their commitment and willingness to uh, work a lot of long hours <coughs> and weekends to get this budget in front of you all today. Um, we're operating at about 50% uh, within the department, so um, we're, we're piecemealing where we can, but we've been able to add a lot of great additional contractual help and internship help, and uh, we're in a really good place. So um, also for the viewing public, um, anybody who would like to see this document being handed out to council today, it will be available, um, be posted on vbgov.com um, soon after the briefing and presentation is over. So with that being said, I will jump into the presentation. So quick high-level overview, um, some highlights that you will see as we walk through this presentation is that the FY23 operating budgets proposed to see a year-over-year -year <coughs> increase of about 6.8% when compared to the current year's operating <coughs> Overall, FTE growth, net FTE growth is about 110 positions, split with 51.2, excuse me, 51.9 coming from the city and about 58 from the schools. Uh, when looking at expenditures, you'll notice that the budget's being positioned to uh, remain flexible as best 
that we were able to um, so that way city council can make as many adjustments as they see fit and make this budget their own through this reconciliation process and also based on the direction and input and um, listening to council over the last several months it was clear direction that we were to try to preserve and maintain existing services as best possible as we move into the revenue sections you'll find that the a lot of majority of the 6.8 percent growth is a result of organic growth in the revenue streams we'll talk touch on a few of those with a few taxes and fee adjustments um, being included in the proposed budget um, also based on city council recent direction as of last week uh, i would like to inform council that the 23 budget does utilize the fair market value approach in establishing and estimating the personal property taxes that results in tax and avoidance estimate of roughly $42.9 million. So with that, last week I was presenting to City Council the tax initiatives and relief efforts to date, or excuse me, the tax relief efforts to date. Uh, that was $105 million, but that same day City Council took action related to personal property and made two additional adjustments. So that brings the total relief, fiscal relief initiatives to date to about $144 million. So as City Council's aware, demand for services has certainly varied um, over the last several years, um, really not just during the pa pandemic, but pre-pandemic, dating back to um, the 531 tragedy. I uh, still find it amazing to this day how the Department of Public Works and IT was able to relocate 400 individuals across the city and impact city services as little um, that actually happened for the public to be able to get in with planning, get things processed. It was quite remarkable. Then as we were coming out of recovery from that in FY21, uh, member, members of council will remember that from this point in time in the process, the proposed to the adopted, uh, the pandemic really set in. And as a result of that, $67 million was removed from the initial proposed 187 FTEs and then post-adoption another 49 FTEs as a result of the desire to maintain stormwater services and not increase the ERU rate. At the same time, due to some fiscal uncertainty, the city also implemented a hiring freeze at that point in time. Over that period of time, um, many departments continued to provide baseline services to the public, meeting the existing demands, but also facing new demands that we never thought we would be facing before, like operating a mass vaccination clinic. In FY21-22, in the current year, City Council continued the fiscal uh, relief initiatives. By, they were the only locality in the Hampton Roads region to lower the real estate tax rate. And throughout the course of the year, as we began to see this issue related to the existing workforce and the labor force, City Council was quick to act to implement initiatives to try to address needs where possible. Some of those including with Parks and Rec, the out-of-school time services. As soon as City Council started to see a reduction in the demand in the service delivery there, City Council was quick to act, plugging that hole. They've also voiced concerns with human services, nursing initiatives, and there's also issues with some um, license uh, positions such as waste collection operator drivers operation drivers so um, that was certainly something that we took into consideration and in hearing council talk about that as we were developing the proposed operating budget <coughs> this is a high level overview of the operating budget you can see here that the 23 operating budget proposed as proposed is 2.45 billion dollars the pie chart here represents uh, allocation um, based on the largest areas that those resources are divided into. So you can see schools represents 46.1% of that pie. Infrastructure related departments in the dark blue planning public works represent about 12.1 with public safety near 12%, the orange slice about 12%. So the 6.8% I mentioned earlier might seem like a high level of growth. Um, as I had noted, a lot of that's being driven by organic growth in several revenues, but there's also another way of looking at it. That's reference to its nominal growth. So another way of looking at it is in terms of constant dollars. So looking at this graph here, um, the nominal growth is represented by the orange line. You can see that that's grown the year-over-year -year growth that we're used to talking about in the annual budget discussion. And the blue line is adjusting that for inflation or keeping that at 2010 constant dollars. So back in 2010, between 10 and 11, uh, there was a significant reduction in city operational costs as a result of the Great uh, Recession. 
So in looking back on that, that point in time, you can follow the blue line and see that even the current year and the proposed FY23 operating budget are still below that FY10 operating budget in terms of real dollars, $2,010, which means and could imply the city is certainly doing more with less. Just because the operating budget has not grown um, in relation to inflation, it certainly doesn't mean that demands for services haven't increased over that same period of time. So this visual here is an indexed marking demand for services dating back to 2010. From that point in time to the end of 2021, there was a 16% demand and service increase in various, what some individuals would see as core functions of government, such as public safety calls, inmates within the correctional facility, Commonwealth attorney cases, Medicaid, SNAP recipients, library um, circulation, and park visits. You can see here that in 2020, the city, just like everywhere else, as a result of the pandemic, certainly saw a dip in the demand for those services as everything was shut down. But in 2021, as is typical, whenever things open back up, people were relying on government services, and you can see double-digit growth at that point in time. <coughs> So looking a little bit more granular look in terms of the operating budget. So this first category or items that I would consider kind of the must do's or the things you need to basically do to kind of keep the lights going and maintain the basic level of services. So starting at the top related to the VRS increase last fall, we had noted that it was going to be a point in time whenever the state adjusts the Virginia retirement system rate for the city. This is something the state does and determines what the rates to be based on long-term actuarial needs of the fund to meet those long-term liabilities, as well as what the rate of return is that the state's seeing in that fund. The result of that increase for the general fund in the city is $6, $6 million, comparing <coughs> FY22 to 23. Something else that we're being mindful of in the development of the operating budget is the costs related to fuel, energy, and um, some of the unknowns related to inflation. So the proposed budget has a set-aside reserve of $5 million uh, reserve specific for this purpose to utilize should those costs go up greater than what's anticipated. Um, that $5 million reserve, for example, one of the known needs already right now is we are, have a good indication that energy bills or electric bills for the city are going to be going up by 30 percent, about $3 million that we would likely be needing that reserve for. Um, the, also, the additional benefits of having that reserve is it would provide flexibility. Uh, should fuel continue, which is a little bit of unknown right now, to be at the $4 per gallon, the city currently buys at market and not a fixed contract. So some funds and operational costs such as, or operational needs such as waste collection um, could certainly be negatively impacted by that. Uh, we would like to be able to use a portion of this reserve should they run into an issue to be able to make them whole and not impact the delivery of those services. I had previously noted that in 21, um, from the proposed $67 million was cut out of that. One of the things that that did include was vehicle replacement cost. Uh, so we had reduced a million dollars out of that, and that operating account has been operating with a million dollars less uh, since that point in time. The 23 proposed budget will request additional resources to make that whole and restore it to its pre-pandemic level. And not only that, but also provide some additional resources as the cost of vehicles have, has gone up and try to hold that constant to where its buying power is not negatively impacted. As we were working with various departments through the operating budget process, there were some needs that departments need additional resources for to be able to maintain those going forward. Listed here are a few examples, such as EMS lifeguard contract. They weren't able to absorb the cost increase for that. Share for few ser food services, as well as annualized costs related to longevity and educational incentive. And Parks and Rec, or previously I'd mentioned the OST initiative and that City Council approved to increase the pay and get those positions for that core or that critical service. Well, the annualized cost for that um, in 23 is proposed to come from, from the general fund as opposed to increasing those fees and charging the residents additional costs for those services. So something else the City Council made very clear, um, not only during the retreat, but based on conversations to date, is that they have a good understanding that it also takes uh, adequate workforce, good qualified workforce to continue to deliver these core services. Um, that's certainly something that we took away from the retreat. And we have tried to position the operating budget to be as flexible as possible 
and allow city council to make their decision regarding this. So with the 23 proposed budget is the baseline services that are proposed to remain in place that city council's previously approved, such as the public safety workforce development um, and the annualized cost for the educational longevity pay for public safety departments. The proposed budget does not recommend an increase in terms of employee health care premiums. And also included in the operating budget is a compensation reserve equivalent to $32.8 million. Uh, based on conversation of the retreat, there was still some conversation going on at City Council. Uh, wasn't quite certain how to move forward with this, so we have positioned it to where these funds could be um, redirected as to the will of the body to implement whatever level of compensation or uh, initiative City Council would like to. That could be the equivalent of 32.8 of about 7.5%. COLA adjustment within the general fund, or it could be sliced and diced to implement portions of market salary, step plan, certainly not limited to those, but just options for council's consideration. <clears throat> Earlier, I had noted that the operating budget was growing by 110 FTEs between city and schools, and roughly 51 of those being within the city. Uh, you can see here on this slide, several of those FTEs are being recommended to be allocated towards public safety departments to maintain critical services. Majority of those being 23 to the Department of EMS. The city's long enjoyed, uh, it reaped the benefits of working with the volunteer rescue squads to uh, maintain this critical service and the city is looking to still continue to provide those services going forward. However, as a result of the pandemic, volunteerism has seen a decline. And as you can see, and they well aware, um, these are just critical services that we can't have uh, service gap delivery in as um, that would mean people's lives are in jeopardy. So the city manager's proposed budget is recommending establishing FTEs within the Department of EMS to continue this critical service. Also, you see that the police department um, is receiving additional funds for some of the annualized costs related to some of the technology initiatives previously approved by city council. And also the, city, the police department's looking to convert some contracted manpower dollars to part-time FTEs uh, to establish continuity of service related to some det detective services. Also receiving FTEs, the fire department for some safety technician positions and the Commonwealth Attorney's Office is receiving two of the four requested FTEs related with the workload associated with expanding the body worn camera program initiative last year and the amount of footage and cases that need to be reviewed with that. The operating budget is also allocating resources to continue to make investments in the business and community support. Uh, it's been recommended that with the disparity study, the first one conducted with the city was nearly five years ago to continue the current practices, policies, and procedures. It's recommended the city <coughs> undergo a second disparity study uh, to ensure that we're still on track and in compliance with our policies. Uh, the planning department is, including the proposed budget, is for the planning department to receive additional FTEs to address existing permits and inspection backlogs, mostly related to building code changes. Uh, however, it's also the desire uh, to improve the Acela program and some of the other systems within the planning department to allow them to get more technical positions in place to make better data informed driven decisions. Um, also, in perfect timing, uh, is the FY23 operating budget. It recommends the allocation of additional $450,000 to continue the existing partnership that the cities have with the Virginia Wesleyan, uh, with Virginia Wesleyan over the last year to continue the workforce development program. Initially, this was stood up through the use of CARES Act funding um, to meet the demands of the public. And going forward, it's proposed or requested that additional fund, local funding be put towards this to continue the service going forward. Another area of core critical needs is mental health services within the community. Um, something that uh, I find particularly exciting about the proposed FY23 operating budget is occurring within the Department of Human Services. Currently, right now, Human Services has four of the existing floors of the Pembroke 6 facility. And being put forth for consideration 23 is the build out of the fifth floor and establishment of a lease space for for human services to move behavioral health, some additional behavioral health services within the building. Uh, this would allow individuals who need those critical services 
to actually find more of a one-stop shop for those services as opposed to venturing to different locations across the city and perhaps potentially not even making it across the city to the facility to get their um, the care and attention that they need. Um, an additional initiative and the request utilization of some attrition savings for this is for a um, public safety wellness and counseling service. This would be able to provide mental health um, counseling services to public safety departments such as police, ECCS, and other um, departments with a demonstrated need. Um, also on here, again, restoring funds that were initially reduced as part of the 21 COVID operating budget is within the Department of Housing and Neighborhood Preservation for the Restoration of Homeless Prevention Diversion Program. That was reduced a couple of years ago. It was continued over the last year through the use of CARES Act funding. However, that's expired. So this is allocating local funds to continue that service. Schools, as a part of their proposed operating budget that was adopted on March 8th, is looking to do similar to the city in terms of trying to maintain as best they can existing uh, school services with a heavy emphasis on investing in their workforce. So schools, as a part of their proposed budget, is including a 0.5% step and a 4.5% 4, 4 COLA. In total, this equals about $28 million in compensation adjustments. They also have a set aside funds, set aside of funding totaling $8.5 million to put towards health insurance where they're looking to potentially reduce employee health insurance premiums. Also, the schools, similar to the city, is, has several hard to fill positions and they're looking to allocate resources to <coughs> allow them to move some of those pay ranges and hopefully become more competitive in the market to get those positions in there. The school's budget, as proposed and approved by the school board, is able to address increases in debt service costs, allocate some additional resources and pay go towards the CIP, as well as state it's their operating budget states that they're able to meet their state and federal mandated requirements. They've also been able to allocate some resources to make investments in um, outdated systems such as the payroll system and their phone system, as well as expand in some areas and establish a security office and the legal services division. So taking a quick look at the school's revenues and what was used to balance their proposed FY23 operating budget is the uh, need for $484 million in revenue sharing formula re local funds from the city. So this is an increase of $27.7 million from the current year's um, revenue sharing formula. And that is the same amount that was provided for two schools back in the fall during the five-year forecast time. Uh, also used to balance the school's operating budget to maintain its current needs is $421 million from the Commonwealth. Uh, this is an increase of $21.5 million from the current year's operating budget, and it's anticipated that the schools will be receiving this in FY23 from the state. So uh, back in the fall, whenever we had initially provided revenue estimates, um, there was still a great deal of uncertainty with where the revenues were going to land as we were still coming out of the pandemic. Uh, as I noted earlier, revenues are rebounding at a quicker rate than what we were anticipating, and several things throughout the budget process caused last-second changes. So, for example, real estate assessment base growing 9.3% as opposed to the 3.8% that was assumed back in the fall of the year. So based on all this information, based on the current year's revenue sharing formula and the overperformance of the revenues in the current year, it's estimated that schools will likely be receiving an additional $22.7 million uh, from overperformance in the current year revenues that would result in the true up at the end of this fiscal year. The revised FY22-23 revenue numbers um, would result, if applied through the revenue formula, would result in an additional $22 million above the base level needs being provided to schools. As the proposed budget by schools does not signify or acknowledge an additional need for resources at this point in time, the city manager's proposed budget includes a hold harmless dedication. And what this is doing is actually withholding that $22 million from the school funding formula at this point in time and redirecting those within the 23 operating budget to address critical needs, some of which I had mentioned earlier, like the need for EMS services, which is a critical function and need to maintain existing base level services. In addition to that, 
um, equivalent of 1.8 cents of this hold harmless dedication is being redirected to a newly established fund to um, defray the costs related to uh, flood protection, or excuse me, to defray the costs associated with a rate increase to um, finance the bond referendum for stormwater. So what's this look like in terms of the 23 operating budget? So the proposed, as I said, the proposed budget would establish a new um, special revenue fund for this purpose. Uh, due to the natural growth of the, uh, the organic growth and the real estate values, there, the need now um, for the bond referendum is a rate equivalent of 4.1 cents. Back in the fall during the referendum, it was noted to taxpayers and the, refer and the um, residents of Virginia Beach that a rate adjustment of 4.3 cent would be necessary. However, as I said, the organic growth resulted in higher per penny value, which actually allowed that um, need to be lowered a little bit. So overall, the need's still $28 million. The proposed budget is recommending a rate increase of 2.3 cents on the base real estate tax to cover a portion of this. And as I mentioned earlier, a redirection of 1.8 cent of natural organic growth in the real estate assessments in the general fund to cover the other portion of that dedication. So in total, the proposed budget establishes a special revenue fund with an equivalent of 4.1 cent of a real estate dedication that would provide um, ongoing sustainable bill paying revenue bill paying revenue for the uh, special revenue fund and ongoing debt service uh, related to the referendum. Some other special revenue fund dedication modifications. Uh, the proposed budget uh, makes a rec includes a recommended adjustment to the open space fund. Um, several council members had talked about the open space fund and the need to revisit that. The proposed budget includes a language and an ordinance to remove the $2.5 million annual maintenance and operating costs so within the open space fund that was being redirected for parks maintenance, as well as redirection of the 6.4 staff that were included in that fund and move those costs to the general fund, freeing up the open space fund to and repurposing it to its original purpose and intent, and that's for site acquisition. Some other special revenue fund modifications include the tip and the tap fund, and the revenue sunset provisions that were sustaining those funds have been extended as part of the proposed budget. And I'll get more into that in just a moment whenever I get into the CIP. So one real quick slide here uh, to finalize um, the, some of the operating budget discussion is that, as said earlier, the intent is to establish as much flexibility as possible for city council in your deliberation decision-making process. The operating budget's balanced through the utilization of $8 million in attrition savings. This is a $7.5 million attrition reserve and the request for $500,000 for those mental health services. Obviously, the city is experiencing a high number of vacancies, and this is acknowledging that. However, we're hopeful over the course of the next year and through council guidance direction, we can kind of shift course in that and start filling some of those long-term vac vacancies. Also included in the operating budget is a $7 million city council emergent need reserve. <coughs> this fund, this is a dedicated reserve based on existing revenue sources. So this is not a reservation of fund balance that would be um, recommended for use on one-time purposes, but instead out of existing baseline revenues. So these resources could certainly be redirected towards initiatives with ongoing costs. So some um, for consideration, but certainly not limited to, could be a reduction, additional reduction in BPOL tax, personal property reductions, which City Council had previously um, done last uh, Tuesday. However, that would also need to be taken into account and um, as part of city council reconciliation as the rate adjustments and the proposed budgets in front of you um, has not is not reflective of that yet um, also for consideration could be an additional reduction of the real estate tax every one cent on the real estate tax reductions equivalent of a reduction of 6.8 million dollars in revenue also for consideration just for information is one one percent compensation increase in the general funds equivalent to 4.3 million dollars or city council could decide to leave those funds as a set aside uh, pending the state decision on the grocery sales tax and if they're going to decide to hold localities harmless or not. The estimated impact to the city is about $13.1 million. This would be shared via the school funding formula with school's portion of that loss being $6.1 million and the city's loss being $7 million. 
So really quickly, I'll move through the CIP so I can maximize council's time for discussion. Uh, here's a quick look at the six-year CIP program. You can see that the CIP is a $2.9 billion uh, six-year annual plan. Um, something about the annual process whenever we're reviewing the CIP is that uh, the baseline, the base year, is really that we begin with section managers is predicated on the previously adopted CIP, meaning that um, basically whatever was programmed in the out years the, is the initial starting point that we tell section managers to begin with. Included in that and their out year projection already in the baseline um, programmed cost is an assumption for inflation and cost increases related to construction. However, um, in the current environment, construction costs are certainly growing at a rate faster than what they were um, originally anticipating. So as we're working with section managers throughout the process, they were able to make adjustments um, in several instances without impacting the timeline and the schedule of projects, either through redirection of the project reserves or through a redirection of resources from other projects that did not negatively impact that project's timeline. So um, in looking at the CIP, uh, first off, stormwater, top priority for city council. Uh, I'm not going to get into the project specifics here, but just um, a couple of high-level things is that as you're looking and reviewing the proposed CIP, stormwater is now going to be reflected in two sections, a water, water quality and stormwater maintenance section and a flood protection program section. The flood protection program is going to be reflective of the bond referendum project and projects and just that the uh, flood protection program and the maintenance portion of the CIP is going to be reflective of the maintenance related projects backed by the ERU. So something else worth noting just at a high level is that ERU backed projects, maintenance related projects, the funding was maintained on those uh, at their historic level despite the uh, ERU being frozen until fiscal year 28 that the operating budget still does that. Um, however, there's also, just as a reminder, $44 million in there um, that City Council put in the stormwater section through the use of ARPA funding. That will be the priority to spend down over the next five years, so we meet the federal timeline on that. Within the economic and tourism sec development section, oh, uh, there's a uh, $200 million increase within that section related to a robust financing plan um, as a result of extending the TIP sunset dedications with the meals, hotel, and cigarette tax. Some of those projects within the TIP fund will include a 17th Street Regional Stormwater Management Facility, um, significant increase to the Atlantic Avenue improvements, sports tourism infrastructure project, sports center modifications, as well as funding for visitors information services. So outside of the TIP, there's also some additional general fund plus up within this section, including $10 million over a two-year period for the corporate landing infrastructure, uh, Burton Station, and an increase in of a million dollars a year in the strategic site acquisition project. Uh, within roadways, um, one of the more complicated sections, always a lot of moving parts in this section. A um, few highlights is that the Laskin Road projects and NIMO 7B projects um, each received additional state and federal dollars, roughly about $4 million um, in each of those projects. Uh, previously, I had mentioned construction costs. Um, and departments and section managers were asked to try to um, balance the resources within their section to uh, not negatively impact the timeline and construction for the projects. A couple of examples within the roadway section where they were able to achieve that was the Centerville Phase 2 project and the Shore Drive Phase 3 project, both now fully funded with Centerville 50.6 and Shore Drive $42 million. Um, a new project included in the roadway section is a project construction, engineering, and inspections. So this is $3.5 million annually and included to provide roadways additional flexibility to um, should they run into a project cost overrun as a result of inflation or construction cost increase. Uh, they could certainly redirect some of those costs related to construction, engineering, and inspection to this newly established project to create the capacity to get a project across the finish line to construction. Um, real quick, talking about schools, I'd covered their operating budget increases earlier, but they also are receiving additional $21 million in state construction funding in FY23. It's the first time in my career here with the city that they've received the, uh, or to my knowledge, that they've received state construction funds. Um, 
just note, full disclosure, the schools are requesting as a part of their CIP additional public facility revenue bonds and year six of the CIP in tune of $12 million. And also a um, couple of notable projects fully funded in the school's CIP are the Betty F. Williams and the Princess Anne High School, um, with Betty F. Williams being $68.4 million and Princess Anne $162 million. <clears throat> Turning quickly to Parks and Rec, earlier I had mentioned the redirection and um, the change of the open space fund to um, focus back on site acquisition and not so much on parks infrastructure and maintenance initiatives. So the result of that was a need to, um, to hold them harmless to program an additional $2.5 million a year. Uh, that's being covered through the general fund and the program CIP. <coughs> so the newly established project to accomplish that is the Parks Development Infrastructure Project. You can see there it totals $21 million. $15 million is being um, to hold Parks and Rec harmless for the open space uh, swap. And an additional $6 million is programmed over the six-year period to allow plus up and work down the backlog of the existing maintenance needs, as well as eventually transition to park development in the future years. So one more caveat to that, uh, as I noted earlier, in redirecting and changing the open space and moving the FTEs to the general fund, there was about a million dollars in operational costs that the general fund um, took on at that point in time. And so year one of the CIP for this project is actually a little bit less uh, than that. So year one's about $1 million, and then each year after that's $4 million in the program CIP. Um, notable projects within the coastal section include Crotan Beach Replenishment Project, as well as funding for the Rudy Inlet Ware Replacement. That project totals $4.9 million. Some increases in new projects um, or existing projects with additional funding needs within the building section. Uh, the funding for the Correctional Center is programmed in the out years of the CIP. Um, that Facilities near four sections of that facility are near now near 43 years old and in need of um, pretty significant renovation and updating and improvements. Also included in the CIP is the Euclid Yard facility. This facility has long been a requested but not funded project in the CIP, and it's been one of the city's um, top <coughs> five uh, facilities in greatest need of replacement for um, for quite some time as well. Uh, also notable project is the courthouse escalator replacement. Um, previously, $4 million was provided for that project due to cost um, estimates. An additional $6 million was needed for that project and programmed in year one, so the total cost of that project is now $10 million and is included in the CIP. IT, um, within the CIP section, received several uh, new initiatives and projects, and majority of them related to human services to improve document management, child services, modernization project, as well as an evidence management system. Uh, the city treasurer would certainly be happy with the next two, the revenue management system sustainment project, as well as um, a check processing system upgrade, and some public safety initiatives, um, including a new project for forensic management system and um, a plus up of the police, or excuse me, the public safety enterprise system project, which will allow for interface solution for e-ticketing. Um, just as a, um, a reminder uh, to council and the viewing public that um, in addition to the local funds that are provided in the CIP, there's also $93.3 million of America Rescue Plan funds um, that are included within these four sections of the CIP and is a significant plus up from where we were a year ago at this time or what we would have been able to do without the use of those funds. So turning to revenue real quick, um, and so having a quick discussion on um, how all this is going to be funded. So here's a high level revenue um, slide, which um, you can see here the arrow indicates what the change in that revenue is doing based on um, the proposed budget. So the real estate tax, as discussed previously, there's a proposed rate increase of 2.3 cents, which would increase the real estate tax rate from 99 cents to a dollar, uh, 1.013 um, on the tax rate. Uh, with personal property, um, again, I mentioned this earlier, uh, city, the proposed budget implements the fair market value 
um, assessment approach as approved by council, resulting in a tax avoidance of $42.9 million that would have otherwise been um, considered, I guess, organic growth and revenues based on the assessments and data valuation. Uh, planning fee adjustments. City Council had received um, a resolution last week for this to be included as part of the budget process. This is certainly part of the discussion process and is not necessarily improved until City Council um, adopts it. Uh, but included in the proposed budget is an adjustment to several planning department fees, buildings, electric permits, um, most, mostly around $20 each. This will be the first time that several of these have been adjusted in nearly 20 years. The overall revenue to, <coughs> that's estimated to result from this is $626,000 and in fact does cover the cost related to, with eight of the FTEs that are proposed to be included in the planning department's operating budget. Also included on here in this slide is the stormwater ERU and waste management fee. Those enterprise fees um, are certainly not being increased or put forward for recommended, recommended increases as part of the 23 budget. But instead, they're just on here to note that they're staying flat. And then also on here is the hotel meal and cigarette tax for the tip and tap fund that I had noted earlier to be extended as part of the proposed budget. This slide, I know, provides a lot of uh, numbers and a lot of details. Uh, so I put some boxes around some numbers to try to help guide um, the viewing public and city council's eyes as we work down this table. Uh, earlier, I noted that a lot of the growth is a result of organic growth within several of these revenue streams. And you can see here in boxes, several of them year-over-year uh, -year growth, budget to budget. You're seeing double-digit growth in, in some of these. Uh, some of the larger include restaurant, amusement, hotel, and general sales. Uh, those are really the consumer-driven revenues. And as I noted, they just have really bounced back a lot quicker than we were originally anticipating. A couple of the other revenues that are notable with double-digit growth includes the real estate, nearly 12%. Um, as City Council is aware, the assessment base is growing 9.3%. The reason this reflects 12% is a result of the additional 2.3 cent rate adjustment that's being proposed to support the bond referendum debt. Also seeing double-digit growth is the personal property value of nearly 12%. The reason for that, if City Council remembers the conversations in the current year, is that revenues were going to overperform. As a result of the fair market valuation, they're still likely going to overperform the 172 reflected there in the adopted budget for FY22, about $5 million. Each, the fair market value um, results basically in that level of kind of organic growth, about $5 million a year. So that's a result of the, um, or excuse me, about 5%, I'm sorry. And that's a result of that um, nearly 12% growth. Um, something that we like to do as part of the annual budget process is also be mindful of what the tax impact is on residents. So here for the, in this slide is a year-to-year -year comparison of uh, the typical Virginia Beach household based on um, the median value with some assumptions applied to being two cars um, and the typical consumer spending. Um, assumptions obviously had to be made with this as we utilize the 2019 data because the 2020 data uh, might be a little impacted as a result of COVID-19. And so this has applied some level of assumption and growth to those uh, to the 2019 numbers. Year over year, the change is estimated to be about $374 um, in terms of the tax impact on the typical family. This equates to about $31 a month. Uh, something else to consider is that this does include the 2.3 cent rate adjustment that's being proposed uh, for the bond referendum. If uh, that was to be accounted for, that equates to roughly a little over $70 per year or about $6 a month um, for that rate adjustment alone. Another thing that we like to do is also do a regional comparison to see how Virginia Beach's taxes that we're proposing stack up with the region. As you can see here in this comparison, Virginia Beach will still be, even with the just proposed rate increase in real estate, would still be the lowest real estate tax rate in the region. Also, um, Virginia Beach is the second lowest uh, in terms of cigarette tax and the third lowest in terms of automobile tax. And it's uh, the second lowest when looking at solid waste collection fee because Chesapeake does not charge that as they cover theirs and their real estate tax. 
So real quick, some closing comments, just as a quick reminder. Uh, the budget, again, like I said, is really being proposed and put forth uh, to maintain flexibility as best possible for council to make the best decisions as they see fit going forward in 23. Again, it does utilize about $8 million in attrition savings to balance the budget with the general fund between the compensation reserve and the emergent need reserve, about $39 million for city council to um, allocate as they see fit. So some key dates and budget timeline. Um, so uh, at the request of council, this budget process is going to be returning back to um, the pre-pandemic process to where we're going to be um, having department heads and CIP section managers come up and present to city council what is included in the proposed budget in much more granular detail than what I've covered here today. So those dates are April 5th, uh, 13th, and April 19th, with April 20th being the first public hearing. 6 p.m. at the convention center on april 26 additional department budget hearings as well as cip presentation uh, will occur at the informal workshop with that night on april 26 a, an additional public hearing here at city hall 6 p.m uh, the itinerary is for city council reconciliation workshop to occur on may 3rd and for the formal adoption of the budget to take place on may 10th um, just a reminder that it's a, a state require or a, a legal requirement that the school's adopted operating budget be in place by May 15th. So this is the um, timeline that is being put forth for consideration and hopefully um, adoption of the budget. And with that, I'll turn it over for questions. Rosemary. Wow. I'm sorry, I know. It, Please have some more. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I mean, my you like goodness. a bourbon old fashioned? Woo! <laughs> I don't know how you said it all. <sighs> There's a lot here, um, Good job. and and we normally don't ask a lot of questions at this point because we have the thing. But one thing I did want to ask: Did you say it's four point one cent an hour? Yes, ma'am. We we talked about putting that in the lockbox. Yes, ma'am. So it, it, is that your plan? It, it, the newly established fund um, that that dedication would go to. That is what that would act as, is a lockbox. So as the revenue stays there, the only purpose of that revenue would be for future debt service payment or costs related to those projects in the, from the bond referendum. And outside of that, all revenue deposited there would remain there for future use for that purpose. So when we do our ordinance, we, that'll have it written that that will be could, in a lockbox for could certainly do that, yes, the bond referendum. We did not Okay. Thank you. Linwood and Guy and John. Uh, Kevin, that was a great presentation. Um, my question is, we don't haven't adopted a state budget yet. What potential impact could that have on our budget? Um, so there are a couple of moving parts. Um, it, some of them would impact the CIP, um, and we would certainly wait till we have more definitive um, direction on that. So typically the point in time when the state adopts uh, is a little bit later in the reconciliation process and we have been able to incorporate those to the best of our ability as a part of the city council reconciliation process and city council is able to incorporate those ultimately into the adopted budget. So some on the operating budget side as I noted would be the grocery tax and if the state decided to um, eliminate that without a hold harmless that would certainly result in a um, reduction of revenue. Okay, Guy, and then um, John. Thank you, uh, Kevin. A lot of work went into this. It's the presentations, uh, given how much we have. Uh, I understood more than I thought and less than I want. Um, one, one thing, just kind of, just trying to get my head around. Could we put up slide eighteen? I believe this is where you talked about hold harmless and I got distracted because I was trying to figure out what you meant you used hold harmless in a couple of times and I'm not sure you used them in the same context could you explain this slide again including explain what you mean by hold harmless with regard to this absolutely um, council member 
can I back up one more to sure. slide mm -hmm. 14? Um, so, 14. yes, sir. Yeah. So um, the last bullet point on there is based on revised revenue um, estimates um, as a result of late changes in the process, um, primarily being driven by the real estate. Uh, if the revised revenues were to run through the existing school funding formula, it would result in an additional need to provide $22 million to schools with no stated needs at this point in time based on their adopted or their proposed yeah, operating I budget. I understand that. Part. So then um, the next slide, I was talking about that $22 million is the amount that would go into this hold harmless dedication, and it would withhold that from the school funding formula and allow for city council to direct that towards um, these other needs that were identified, including... Okay, I guess I'm just not understanding how hold harm I, I got that process yes sir of your your taking 22 million out well, yeah. who's being held harmless that's and in what what way I guess it's that's a specific right. term inside the school yeah. funding formula yes uh, um, so it, w it would be schools um, council members so in doing in providing that hold harmless dedication it would hold schools revenue through the revenue sharing formula the local amount provided schools to 484 million um, dollars, which is currently what they have um, in their baseline proposed 23 operating budget. And then also, and this might be the part that um, is, is confusing, I guess it could also be interpreted <coughs> that that hold harmless is also being redirected and um, defraying a portion of the real estate tax rate adjustment that would be necessary to sustainably finance the flood protection program. I mean, it's hard to say you're holding the schools harmless. <laughs> For the twenty-two million, they're not. I mean, the budget doesn't direct that money to the schools, but correct. The the school funding formula policy would, if not for that dedication, yes, sir. Hey, John. Uh, well, one thing I'd like. One thing we didn't mention in your pro. What is the public notice going to say that the state law says is the real estate rate that holds residents harmless? since they haven't been mentioned this evening. What is that rate? The state law that requires us to set it at the revenue neutral rate and we have to advertise and then increase the rate. What is that rate? So the, the effective tax rate, correct? That's so the, the revenue neutral tax rate based on the assessment growth um, would be 91, roughly 91 cents um, that will be included in a public hearing ad that gets posted this coming Saturday for a public hearing to take place on, I believe, April 26th. So the real tax increase is 10.117% over and above what the state law would require because we're having to vote to increase it to 1.013, correct? From compared to what the public hearing ad were required by law to post in the public hearing ad, that is correct, but it's an annual tax that has to be adopted each year. So the, the rate has to be but that law doesn't mean it's just a rate for rate's sake. It's if we take no action, that is the actual rate that goes in place. Well, I think what I was, I'm sorry, Council Member, what, what I was saying is we're required by law to adopt a real estate tax rate every single year. That's correct. And so that's, that's what, yes. What I want to mention is it actually represents a growth in real estate tax revenue of $70.88 million, which is the difference between 91 cents and 1.013 cents. So we really are having a sufficient increase in taxes. I just want to make sure that people know, that residents know that, and are not being held harmless. Could you go to slide six, please? Yes, sir. I just have a few questions. I have a lot of other questions I want to. I only want to mention the five-year forecast, council members may recall, there was a slide slightly like this, and this showed what the median family income was from 2010 through 2019, if my memory serves me correct, and showed that real family income had only gone up per the CPI by a half a percent per year over that nine-year period, which I'm sure if you went out there, it'd even probably be negative. My only point being is that CPI, which also applies here, discounts food and energy, the two biggest discretionary expenses of families. So families' budget line would be below what the city line shows. So families haven't done any better. 50% of our families are worse off today than they were in 2010 or even 2019. So I think that's, we ought to just put those in context. But yes, the city's budget adjusted for inflation, 
But 50% of our families, in fact, the bottom 80%, if you believe the, the Treasury Department, uh, have gotten worse. So, I mean, I'm just talking that when you think about the relative tax burden, I just think that put that in perspective. Could you go to slide 14? I think, I hope we, matter of fact, I'm going to be bringing it up. We need to go back and look at that $54.9 million that we already, because we can look at it in the context of this budget, because I know industry is already looking, we looking at their capital spending. Home families are certainly looking at their capital spending. So what is the value added of accelerating school construction by a year? And how much is that costing the taxpayers? And how much tax relief could we gain if we stuck with the schedule and didn't accelerate the programs? I don't know if they can show us how students six years from now are going to be that much smarter because we pushed that to the right by a year. I'd like to understand that. And also remind council there's three and a half, there's three and a half million dollars on turf fields, which we could recoup in the CIP. That would go a long way to tax relief. So I think the, the schools, and also that doesn't include the money that's with the state that doesn't show up in the school board's budget, but which they can be reimbursed. Is that correct? They talked about the tranches of CARE Act money, but it didn't show up in their budget. They had to submit it to the state. The state had to approve it, and they said it really wasn't in their revenue. So that $85 million to $100 million is not in this budget, correct? It it is, it is in the budget. It's in. It's a part of the schools appropriated, but I believe what they were referring back to in the fall of the year was the redirection or repurposing of some of those um, funds, possibly. Could we get that itemized for us so we can understand that when we're looking at the budget? That would be great. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I had was on slide 18, the same one that Mr. Tower asked about. Um, so if I got this right, I understand what the school thing is. They have, they don't have a requirement for the money. As a matter of fact, they have more money, I think, than they really can execute. You mentioned that they were going to be over performance revenue of $22 million, correct? Yes, sir. In, in, the, in right. the current year. So using the funding formula, if you divide that by 0.46, which is our revenue sharing piece, does that mean that we are estimating that our over execution will be 25 point, our over performance revenues will be 25.8 million? I believe that to be correct. It's Thank reflected in the um, the general fund fund balance calculation, council member, in the executive summary. There's a detailed breakdown of it. So that means that there's 25, 8 million. So in the back, we'll look at that breakdown. We look, but you spent, you put in the budget the 22 million. You, you have it in our operating budget as an expense, correct? The school I, portion, you're proposing that that go in the operating budget as an expense? N no, sir. Um, in terms of the school's uh, current year reversion amount due to the overperformance of revenues, that is being reflected as a reservation of general fund fund balance at the end of the year. That's impacting the fund balance calculation. So there, that means there's, there's a total of $47.8 million of overperformance revenue, correct? Potentially between the city and schools, if, if you're taking that and divide, yes, sir. So when we, take, when we look at the ending fund balance in our range, which you didn't show, I'm trying to understand what is the real money so that people are going into their savings to pay their bills today. And I'm sure you've seen those emails and you probably, hopefully probably know someone who has to do that. So if we have $47.8 million, which is my calculation of overperforming revenues, why aren't we talking about more tax relief? We don't have to answer that tonight. That's for us. I'm trying to bring that to council's attention. There is a lot of money out there on top of a $70 million increase in real estate tax revenue, which is 85% residential. So it's disproportionately falling on our residents. And those people who are getting 20% and 15% increase in assessments are getting a huge bill. And it isn't reflected by that slide showing the impact on the average citizen. It's just not true. Okay, anybody else? All right, thanks, Kevin. The torch is lit. <laughs> Council is a lot to fit in one presentation. Departments will be able to do the budget much more uh, service than what I was in this one. You wouldn't mind repeating the briefing. highlights for you. Yeah, I'm absolutely. I'll, do, I'll go through it. <laughs> only kidding. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, thanks a bunch. All right, we're going to move on to a couple uh, you know, Council discussion items. And uh, we had, a, you know, uh, you know, as part of the retreat at the end, we had open dialogue, and a couple of suggestions came up. Um, I'm going to ask the uh, vice mayor 
uh, Wilson to cover A, and then I'll get the ball rolling on Part B. Um, did everybody get in their packet the council policy? Okay. So there were two. They are. There. Uh, I'm going to take the, the latter first. One was the communication sent to all employees. And what this means that individually we can't send emails to blanket to all employees. It has to either come through the vice mayor or the, or the mayor if there's something, there's a message. So if there's something somebody wants to send, you have to send it through, through us. Uh, so this is going to be on the agenda, I believe, next week, if that's okay with everybody. Does everybody have a copy of that? Because I no. didn't not think I, it, so many I think I was directed to provide that only to you and the mayor. I don't have it. Uh, that's why I asked if people got oh, copies. Well, from this distance, it looked like something else we got. Yeah, well, <laughs> okay, do we have this, copies of this? I, I'm passing <laughs> copies down now because I thought you might need them. Yeah, that's why I asked. I'm going to apologize for that faux pas. I didn't know well, it if it was like in the package or not. That stack of stuff we got. I mean, they all look alike. Well, that is. <laughs> well, we talked about that. it that's at the. Yes. The, the, the package that went to everyone was the one that had the uh, amendment regarding meeting dates. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's not a very complicated Can issue. Lewis, okay, any, any questions or comments on I think it? Lewis needs to continue to pass it now. We don't have Yeah, I'd like to read it. Okay. You might as well pass this one too. That's the other one that's, I guess, going to be next. Lewis, it's tough with you. Here it goes. It just says, if a member of the city council desires to send a communication to all city employees utilizing the city resources, which is like the email, the member shall share the proposed communication with the mayor and vice mayor, who shall consult with the other members of the city council. With the consent of the city council, the communication may be sent to all city employees, and it shall be from the mayor or the vice mayor, and it shall be sent on behalf of the entire city council. So what can, can can you just uh, walk me through? I'm just trying to understand it. What, what like what's the what's the basis for this? Well, this was brought up at the retreat that it. Okay, I, I was. Some people you know, felt that it was day. an issue. This was the second day. Yeah. Okay, I'm okay. sorry. I was. I wasn't there yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Happy anniversary again. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, all right, so this was this was part of the discussion. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think part of the reason is that, you know, as council members and, and especially as council changes and everything, um, you know, I think it's important that, it, you know, the information we get to employees go through, you know, a process okay. and also that nobody could have accused of electioneering or, you know, or soliciting, uh, you know, you know, that type of situation. And, but it's not to say that the message can't get out, but, you know, we just want to, you know, just put a thing in there and, and even if necessary, we run it through the city attorney for, or the city uh, manager for city accuracy, manager. you know, things like that. Because we're a city manager form of government, we really want the city manager to be okay with it too, because they're his employees. Mm -hmm. right. Well, the key right. words here seem to be utilizing city resources. Right. And so, uh, what you, what resources are we talking about? Email, mostly the email. Mostly email. Yeah, John. Well, my because I, I pick up my view is even if you were doing it from your personal machine because you had copied the email, you're still interacting to deliver that has to go over the city's IT infrastructure. So that is still city resources. I believe that's the intent of this reading. So, uh, but I, I don't want to put it here, but I would just think it would be wise, and I'm sure the mayor and the vice mayor, that we should look carefully at any communication being sent 60 days prior to an election, no matter what the merit might be. Oh, good idea. But I'm not saying it has to be here. I'm assuming that you'll exercise good judgment in that regard, but I no, I trust your judgment. You know, like I said, John, this doesn't pre, pre, uh, preempt a, um, 
message from getting out, but we just want to make sure the intent and the integrity of the message is in line. Michael. Call on board. Thank you. Well, as, as one of the folks who spoke at the retreat um, in favor of a policy like this, I think that it's just important that um, there isn't even the perception about electioneering, as someone said, or politicizing communications to city employees. At the end of the day, that's more than 7,000 people. And um, I think that it is um, entirely appropriate that any message to those 7,000 people who work hard and serve our city come from the mayor on behalf of the city council. And that was the basis for, for my perspective on this. I'm just thinking out loud, if I may, Mayor, um, I also think we may want to consider including as part of this policy other forms of communication, such as Twitter, Facebook, social media, um, because we could be creating a gap here where the policy specifically says email. However, um, a council member may request that a Twitter message go out on behalf of them from city platforms, and I think we should preclude that same type of potential conflict from appearing by, we may want to consider more broad language that would include such as Facebook, social media, or other forms of other forms of official city communications other than uh, about programs that are approved by the council, sponsored by the council, or um, about, for example, forums or other things. I don't know if it, uh, that can get a little bit nuanced, but I think we may want to include more broad language. Possibly. Yeah, uh, I think the important thing, though, with that, Michael, is to make sure that it's city-based, that it certainly doesn't stop any council member from uh, using, you know, social media and other things to, you know, if you do, you go to a ribbon cutting or an event or, you know, something like that, it's okay to put on your personal. On your personal. I'm talking you know, about the personal city. thing. City. But the actual city utilization of city, uh, you know, type of thing, PSAs and stuff like that. And, but the other thing is, too, um, you know, what, what, you know, what, what is really, th you know, this, it, you know, Rosemary and I are, are not going to be the sole, you know, Siskel or Rebert. You know, we're going to be talking to the city manager about potential impacts of what may go on and the city attorney to make sure that, you know, the message going out uh, is in line with city policies and things of that nature. And, and I have never in 22 years ever used any of it. Okay. Sabrina. Oh, can I ask what, what led to this? What specifically? Because oftentimes when you create a policy such as this to address specific behavior, but your policy is broad and ambiguous, you're not addressing most likely that issue. Can can I ask what issue was it? Because I, I was not there. What, is it a specific issue? No, it's just, it, it was, or because it was something that was brought up. You mentioned what, no, it was what pre, was it, it? It's a preemptive thing to make sure that you know council, it, you know messages thing and doesn't you know council members aren't going out and sending you know personal messages to every employee, which is, which could be uh, inappropriate. So no one's doing that now. It was brought up at the retreat that they didn't think it would be appropriate that any of us do that. Yeah. So um, I just want to make sure I understand what, what you're saying to me. It doesn't make sense. It, it, you're saying you're trying to preempt something from happening after, I mean, after all these years, if nothing has happened, why now? It doesn't make sense. Well, we're improving the process. Michael? Well, still, I'll I'm say, sorry. I'm okay. still, I have another question. Um, my other question is, so does this also include correspondence that goes out of the mayor's office, whoever that may be, the mayor and the vice mayor, do you, will you be consulting with the body before you're sending out specific before, communication? Not currently, depending on the message. Okay, so this applies to the mayor's office and vice mayor? No, that applies to sending group uh, messages to all things. The mayor has to have some latitude in, you know, sending out, you know, correspondence. Okay, that's what we do. But we're talking about mass right here. So, so, so let me just make sure I understand. This is for group messages, and it should be, um, I guess, collectively agreed upon by the body before it goes out. 
-hmm. if it's a member of council. But if it's a member from the mayor's office or the vice mayor's office, you're not doing that. That's not in consideration. No, I, I, and um, a lot of the co most, almost every correspondence we get out, Man, council gets there. a copy of the Man, letters on the oh. Okay, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, Mark. Michael. Oh, yeah. Michael. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay. I think how it's, I, I think how it's written. It's saying that the council member, including I think the mayor as well, would court would have a conversation with council before they send a message to all city employees. Yeah, this, this is strictly for all the employees. And and I would also, if if I might, I would also add that although in the purpose and need, it specifically mentions letters uh, or emails in the act of paragraph it says any person any member of city council which i would agree with mr duhaney applies to the mayor and the vice mayor and it's a communication to all city employees using city resources that would include any of the city's social media platforms mm -hmm. then <laughs> it has to yeah. go to the mayor mm -hmm. okay michael and the vice mayor well i'll speak directly to the question that was posed by uh, Ms. Wooten, because there is a council member who is sending messages that way. Okay. And um, I've received complaints about it okay. from city staff. Um, and it also, I think, puts us as colleagues, as a body, in an uncomfortable situation. For example, there have been messages which are very, I'm sure, well-intentioned. Uh, happy holidays, um, uh, memorializing the events that occurred on May 31st from individual members of city council to the entire city staff. I think the position that it puts um, other members of the body in is that it potentially m gives the appearance that that member cares more than other members do. And, and I don't think the city staff needs to be subjected to 11 individual mem messages about holidays, about specific anniversary events that are very traumatic. Um, and so I think it's uh, best practice and I think it's courteous, most courteous to the employees that those messages come from the mayor on behalf of city council, not from individual members. So I don't mind speaking directly to that, to that matter. And that's one of the reasons I brought it up. It, I'm not comfortable with it personally as a member of this body, but I also think um, I've, I've heard from a number of members of our city staff who have expressed concerns and reservations about that practice. Yes. Well, thank you for uh, your transparency. That's what I'm looking for when I ask that question. Um, I, I will say that uh, I indeed send out messages concerning the holidays and different things. So I, I'm not sure if that was directed to me or not, but I, I do that and have sent it through the city manager's office. Um, I don't send it out without permission, but I do send it to make sure people are aware uh, or the city manager's office is aware because he is the person that they report to not us. So the direct chain of command would be if you're sending out correspondence, you send it to the person in charge of that body and it they approve, then you send it out. Last time I checked, city council, the staff does not report to us. They report to the city manager. Okay. All right, this suggestion is out there, and uh, we can, uh, you know, bring it forward and have further People discussion. People can vote for it or not. Yeah. The, the other, wanna... that's fine. The yeah. other, um, it is. the other issue that has been on our minds that we also discussed is the speaker policy. And just to sum it up, is on the consent agenda, we have had one speaker that has consumed a lot of time. And I'm very, oh, this is a starting point of a conversation. Uh, on the consent agenda, it's been recommended that there's one person speaking on consent that they get a total of three minutes, I mean, per item up to 10 minutes. But there's some people that I talk to who would like to adjust that time. So I'm very open to adjusting that time. So whatever this body would like to do to adjust that time, that's that's fine with me. So I, I open the floor for, for, for what the body would like to do. Yes. Well, I'd like to open up, excuse me, oh, in two dimensions. One, I'm in favor of uh, five minutes myself. 
but I could support 10, but I'm in favor of five. But I think more important than the time, since we're talking about now changing a policy that affects the people that we work for, I think we should have, just like we would on a big issue, we should have a public hearing and then have a vote later. I'm not willing to vote next Tuesday without having what we've agreed out for the public comment, allowing them to comment and then have a vote later. I think we, we've dealt with the issue for a number of years. I'm just trying to give oh, no, you both. That, that's I'm just trying idea. to give you no. both because I think that's the, the people that we work for deserve have a right to tell us that we've either lost our minds or they think we, they agree with this. But I would favor even five. And then this body, if we hear something that we think, and I know this body has done it many times, that we think merits being pulled off the agenda before we vote, we would. But I think that people that have a big issue can get it addressed in that time frame uh, and that we can get on with the other business. So I would favor five. So we could do a public hearing. Is everybody else okay with five minutes? Mm -hmm. I would say uh, seven minutes, just because I like <laughs> well, the numbers. <laughs> well, also, Linwood said six because Seven minutes. Three, because I think seven minutes three. is good. I like John's better. <laughs> but Lynn said six because it's three minutes and three minutes. How about a compromise? You just I'm pick, open to pick a number and we hear for the public. We can always adjust. There we go. I'm sorry. So I need to say one thing. So in this um, room, we're a little, um, our technology is for three and ten minutes here. In the new city hall, that will be different. But just so you know, our lights, that's, that's all that they are allotted for the, our three and 10 minutes. So, so six makes sense then. Just, I just wanted to make sure you were aware for this building. Yep. So you could do two, three minutes. Three and 10 yep. makes mm -hmm. sense. Right. And right. we could do anything. I can, you, I can get chimes again if you'd like. Get the chimes and the stopwatch. <laughs> what? All right, but we need, let, let, let's see if we can put something in writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the the 71 year old uh, you know hearing impaired veteran that was around jet aircraft and his misspent youth. What could I tell you? Well, you want to go around the table and start with Lynn? Lynn yeah. What do you yeah, want? What do you think? Oh, six. Oh, six. oh, this is good. This be good. Michael. Good. I'm fine with six. Well, oh, I'm I'm sorry. I don't understand the question. We're, we're, is this is this the cumulative <laughs> limit or the yeah. individual single limit? Item five, six, or seven, or ten <laughs> for consent agenda. No, for this question agenda. we're sticking with three basically. The cumulative level would cumulative. be either six, five, six, seven, or ten. Well, well, I, I reject seven <laughs> what for the reasons <laughs> proffered by the clerk, but I can, I can, I can live with uh, six, nine, or ten, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I, 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 three and three I'll, and I'll be Mr. Mr. What? Tower just for a second. I, I just like because you know this 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 ordinance is going to be in effect when we go into a new building. So don't limit yourself just to those numbers. You could pick eight. We, we I, can change. I, I, I'm just saying you could I am, choose eight. I am well different as long as it's a reasonable time limit. <laughs> okay. I, I don't, and I consider any You're any of those right reasonable. You're I am. Yes. Sabrina, no comment right now. Okay. Well, I'll go with six. I'll go with six. Six is fine. Yeah, what we're saying is that mm -hmm. any one person speaking on a consent agenda would have a maximum of this amount Correct. for the all of the items on the consent agenda. Well, Correct. we have when well, we have one speaker on consent. Uh -huh. But I mean, I think the whole idea of the consent agenda is it's not something that we've got speakers on, or it wouldn't be on the consent right. agenda. So this is just for the consent agenda. One one single item. Well, I like five minutes, but I'll go with six. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with Barbara, but six. Works this with is the like the old Paris peace table back in the day. The machine yeah. does six, so I'm six. We can do five. Rocky. Uh, I'm six too, but on that speaker's policy, and, and I don't know the, uh, <clears throat> I hadn't read the rules of it, but we allow speakers to sign up all through the night. And I want to say to Madam Clerk, she has to really juggle a lot of things. And sometimes I'm trying to pay attention to what's being said and people are over there trying to get signed up to speak at the last minute. So if we're going to get a policy in place, let's make it all encompassing and, and fix the sign up and say you have to sign up by X amount of time because they're That's constantly coming up. Uh, last week we had one, and I know John was trying to listen, and he was looking over me, and, 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 and it was just, so my th I'm good with six minutes, but I think we need to make it all-encompassing and, and fix it where if you're not signed up by X, Y, Z time, then, then you can't speak. Mr. Uh, Attorney, is that? 
Uh, it, you, you, you can do it. It's 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 legally permissible, and and a lot of jurisdictions do do it. But you have never. So, um, but, but can I? Well, I've got yeah. the get chair <laughs> for that discussion. I do want to point out that there are two other changes in the policy that was handed out to you that are, in my view, just housekeeping. But when you see them, I want you to know what they are. The the vi the mayor has read now for more than two years a statement that says. Anybody who's not speaking except as to a planning item gets three minutes. That was not clearly stated in the policy previously, and it's clearly stated in there now for non-planning items where a public hearing is not required. The other change is you had in your policy for open mic that only three people could speak per topic. And we, ha I have advised the clerk that I believe that that is a content-based restriction and so we have not been enforcing that now for some period of time. And so we changed the policy to delete that limitation. So I just wanted you to know yes, that there were, there were two other text changes in the policy. And if directed, any other changes the body wants, we can prepare for you to, to review and to consider. Yes, Guy. Is there any overall time limit on uh, public? comment and the open mic? No, sir. It was a proposal at one time before this body, but it died for lack of a second, is my memory. That's correct. And I think that should be deferred to another day. Okay. Uh, Brock, okay. And uh, then. What about the other thing that. Well, what, I oh, thought I'm we were sorry, talking about Aaron. Policy. Uh, Aaron, why, we're why, waiting on you. Oh, I get to make the final. Okay. No, I, I agree with everybody. Six is fine. Okay. Can, so, can what, I make a comment about something that. Council Member Holcomb mentioned yeah. to the policy. So in terms of limiting uh, when people can come and sign up to speak, the only thing I would say, I'm, I'm cautious about that because people have, residents have all kinds of commitments. Most people can't make a six o'clock meeting. So they may come a little bit later. But what they have to say is important and we should hear it. And so I'm, I'm, I'm cautious about cutting off that time frame from them because a lot of people are working. A lot of them um, have children, child care issues, all sorts of things. You never know what a person's going through. So for me, I'm cautious about doing that. I would not support that because um, people do need that little bit of grace um, because sometimes they do want to say something. They may be here late but we still should hear what they have to say. I don't see uh, where that, there's been, an, for me, I don't see an issue there. Um, of course, when they're going over to speak to the, the clerk, you may hear some of the conversation or you may, that might be an issue, but other than that, um, that's not an issue for me. It doesn't distract me. But what I wanna make sure that we're not doing is restricting the citizens uh, from, from having um, their due say at this public meeting. Okay. So Where's Mary? in the new building, and I can see where it could be distracting uh, uh, with the conversation here. for y'all on the end. Here definitely is. In the new building where you're sitting, is it gonna be this distracting to the council members? It's just like this. Just essentially like this. yes. Is somebody it's stationed like at the door on the way out? Right. Uh, or no. in you front of the door? No, because well Terry will be here with me just like now running the voting machine so um if we need to have somebody another clerk okay, stay yeah. um we, we shut down before six yeah, what, what i'd suggest now is that at least we move forward and then we'll have the public hearing and then we can flush it out and find out what the public's like yes right that's the best it's, well, at least we'll do the it's time. not it's not as round it's just a little spread out, more spread I, out. I thought your, your new desk had like an invisible fence around it no sorry yeah gotta wear a collar first oh, there we go yes mr Burr, returning so i'm just trying to make i want to make sure that i understand the direction because i get in trouble when i don't uh so we're changing the 10 to 6 and that's the only change I'm making, or am I, from what I passed out today? Yeah, what, what change, I changed it to six minutes. 
Okay, and that's it. Yeah, Everything yeah, else now. is as it is what. And then we'll have today. the you know we'll add into the discussion if necessary. And the vote will be on April fifteenth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are we going to do that with both of those policies? The internal policy is internal to us. I think that's fine. Can, okay. The public that, that affects the, the people should have a chance to speak. Yeah, so that one will be on account. for a vote next week. The speaker policy will be on for public comment and a vote on the 19th, if you're ready. And what about the one changing the meeting, the, uh, calling for your formal meetings after the second and fourth Wednesday, Tuesdays? I think okay. we can do that on the first, don't you think? We can do that on the on We can do that on the Was that acceptable as it was yeah. prepared? Okay. Yeah. Mr. Haney. Mr. Mayor, one last clarification. The one for council members' communications to all city employees. It sounded like there was a, a frago in the conversation with council. It sounded like we even at council even indicated that possibly even want to apply this to individual council member events from marketing standpoint. That if it's not a event that's been approved by council that it before it gets marketed that it needs to be vetted by council before the city uses city resources to market it yeah okay. i think that was a good policy i, I think we need to clarify i know there have been times mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. like giving uh people the day before christmas off that the mayor has sent out an email to tell the employees that they have that day off mm -hmm. i mean yeah. I don't know. I mean, there's, there's, there have been times like that. Yes, I, I think. But that's a specific charter authority. It's the only executive authority that anyone has mm -hmm. is to declare a holiday. It's in the charter, and it's the mayor. It comes with a half-million-dollar bill, mm -hmm. last count. But that is a specific executive mm -hmm. authority, totally in the discretion of the mayor, and I'd have no issue with that. Yeah. Mayor. Okay. Yes. Mayor, I think uh, I'd like to offer one caveat to mm -hmm. that. I, I do support that. I think the um, the one caveat could be, and this has been greatly appreciated, and I think it's needed, is promoting um, council members' town hall, mm -hmm. individual council members' oh, okay. constituent town hall. I think would be an exception. Okay. So All right. Good point. Okay. You mean promoting so, somebody's so, town, but that's going to all employees. Mm -hmm. I mean, no. Oh, sorry. We wouldn't do that for mm -hmm. all employees. No. So, yeah. Let me clarify. Let me say what I heard. Right. So what I heard is that. We got what, where everybody's okay, more or less, or the, a majority of council members are okay with the council member communications to all city employees. What we're also going is, well, what we're also saying is that unless it's for council member related town halls, if it's a specific event that's not a town hall, then we need to run it by council before, unless it's been a, approved by council already. We need to run it by council before we market those things. Yeah. Or you can send it out. <clears throat> yeah. Like like Miss Henley's um, meetings, mm -hmm. you can announce that there's a meeting that Miss Henley is having. Yeah. Correct? Well, that's how it really works today. That's like mm -hmm. City yeah. Day and all those places. Okay. Wait a minute. They never do, but <laughs> that's mm -hmm. all right. I'd love okay. to have it. <laughs> yeah, Mark. I, I'm just a little confused because I see that as being of a different scope and I'm not sure it's the same policy this is talking about communications to all employees yeah. what the manager is addressing is a communication to the public more broadly so we can draft that but I I would suggest that's a separate yeah I think yeah, that's right. separate you're item. right Mark that is separate mm -hmm. yeah so we'll, we'll just would you like us to one go ahead and prepare yeah. that and do you, do you want us to draft that I don't know. Not right now. Not yeah, right now. We don't need a policy. I don't think Nothing's so. broken. Does council agree like that? <laughs> yeah, not right now. Let's just handle this for now. Okay. All right, I good. I think we should do. I mean, I my personal to... view is that we should we should knock this out together, but if that's not majority supported by majority on council. I agree, I agree with that. Okay. We got other things. Okay, moving on to the final item. Uh, if you don't mind, I, I'm going to kind of set the table on this for a few minutes because. I'm going to take some responsibility. It was probably the responsibility, you know, for the you know, <coughs> the time it took to get this to this conversation, and explain to you it, from my uh, vision about you know some of the complications and barriers and things that we had there. After the tragic death of George Floyd, uh, we reconvened uh, re uh, reconvened the African American. Round table, and then we had a civil unrest. And um, 
you know, basically it was a very emotional time for a lot of people. Uh, there were local and national uh, calls for defund the police and the establishment of strict re uh, review boards like this. And a number of the public were uh, demanding, you know, unfettered uh, subpoena power and disciplinary power. And uh, you know, th then we had a couple other things. And, you know, th this is just was my assessment at the time that when you're a state in a high state of emotion, sometimes it's the worst time to make, you know, policy and decisions. And the other factor was we had an interim police chief in place at the time. And we wanted to make sure that, you know, they went ahead and, you know, got the police chief on board. And, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is, you know, an emotional uh, thing to, you know, many people out there. It's important, and I think it was important to get it right. And, uh, you know, one of the things, and, you know, I'm just going to say this, as a focus group of one, you know, uh, you know, during that summer, especially after George uh, Floyd, our police department was demoralized quite a bit. The, uh, their police departments all over the country were under national uh, scrutiny. Defund the police, take away their sovereign immunity, uh, and you know, in, in many ways, it was a, nas a national. Um, you know, thing going on to, you know, to, to vilify police and, you know, and the thing is, you know, I, I'm very, I am, as we are, very proud of our police department. Uh, you know, they do magnificent work under extraordinary conditions. And when you look into our use of force policy, it, we have one of the strictest policies you know, going in terms of generating an excessive use report. For instance, if a police officer touches somebody's wrist putting on handcuffs, a report is generated to that effect. And even in spite of this high scrutiny, our numbers have been relatively low. Now, is it to say that all police departments are, you know, 100% uh, folks that are in compliant, there's no bad apples. I can tell you that within physical therapy, I can tell you all of us in our professions know that there are certain people that should not be there. But that being said, and moving forward and, you know, getting it right, and, you know, we did have a study team that come in and came back with some recommendations. Uh, but once again, I think, um, you know, number one, I don't think, my personal thing I'm going to recommend to the council is that we, first of all, place this under the jurisdiction of the city manager, okay? I have 100% copy uh, confidence in his ability, and, uh, you, you know, I think organizationally because of some of the other recommendations I'm going to make. And the other thing is I don't think at this point in time that we have the volume of, you know, the complaints and things that justify a full-time equivalent, uh, you know, position. As we go forward and look at the problem that we are creating generically, <coughs> when we look at violence, and, you know, once again, it's highlighted right now in the paper the last couple of days, you know, outbreaks all over the place. The problem, we, not have got, we need a strong independent citizen review board, but we also need strategies in place that address the problems that you know, cause the violence, that cause police to react. And, uh, you know, there's a couple other things that, you know, uh, manager and I discussed was, you know, having one person be encompassing over a couple departments or entities that would justify a full-time position. You know, for instance, this person could be over Human Rights Commission also. It could be also over the Minority Business Council. And then we also are established and really getting rolling with the IDEA Commission, uh, inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. And part of our 
main thrust that we're going to be doing after a couple of, uh, you know, breaks is not only we're not going to be involved with an independent review board at all. I think the most important word in there is independent, that they have to be allowed to function independently. But once again, we're going to be providing those resources and we're going to be focused right off the bat on the mental health aspects of the problem, getting into the families, helping people that were incarcerated uh, when they get out to make a transition. We're going to be looking at workforce development, affordable housing, physical health, and a few other things. And everybody's going to be, uh, um, you know, we did it, did it up some of the responsibilities. We're going to be leveraging. And right now, we have a tremendous faith-based community out there. I often say that uh, the strength of Virginia Beach, one of them is that we're a faith-based community of many faiths, and it's the glue that holds us together. But you have all these organizations out there operating in silos that, uh, you know, but once again, if we could start unifying, I think we could create a stronger force. So, you know, with the other things, especially with the human rights um, organization, uh, and uh, then also with the, um, you know, the Minority Business Council, we can build a better, uh, you know, community. Hey, but it certainly does not imply that this review board is, you know, not of paramount import importance of how to do it. So in a nutshell, I'm, what I'm going to recommend and throw out for discussion that, number one, it be placed on, uh, under the city manager, and uh, uh, but once again, until such time, if there is ever necessary, the ability, uh, the need to uh, expand it to a uh, FTE, a full FTE position, that it also <coughs> becomes the uh, over overseer of the umbrella that uh, it looks at other areas that would work in coordination to solve a lot of the problems <coughs> that our, um, you know, city has. And then the question is, do we, uh, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? You know, do we hire the person first or, or do we start the selection process knowing that they have to go through training and things like that and maybe also be involved in the decision process? But when push comes to shove, yes, I will take the responsibility for, you know, the delay. But in retrospect, having that study group, I really think, turned out to be most effective. Rosemary and then Sabrina. Uh, Bobby, that was really well said. Um, I, I think the first decision that we need to make today is, is it okay to start taking applications with their talent bank form? This is going to be probably at least a six-month process to get this thing up and going because we've got to make the application available get them back in they're going to have the interview team's going to have to go through them and interview them and come back to the council with recommendations um, i i think that we should select this board first and then the board members can be part of the selection of the board coordinator you know I, maybe not totally hire them but the, input be, well, they could be part part of the, the interview team for that. So, the board coordinator's got to be hired, and then after every all of that's in place, then there's got to be training, and that's going to be at least a week of training. Isn't that correct, Mr. Dehaney? It'll. Um, Nate, we could probably get an organization like NACO to do a week training, yeah, and that, so at a minimum, that's a week. But then there's also other. Um, things that we want to, them to learn with the law department and also the police department as well that'll probably right. take um, much longer than that. But the NACO intensive training could probably be done in about a week or so. Yeah, so you've got to get the training in. So it's going to be quite, quite, a, 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 there's a lot involved here. So, but the first step is, and I think I asked last week, is everybody okay with the talent bank form? And, and I think, I didn't see anybody saying no. So. If we can all tell Amanda it's okay and we can get the word out so that we can start accepting applications, that's the big first step. And then the other big decision that I think we need to make, and I support Bobby's recommendation about being under the, under the manager, because I think it's, a, it's very much a part-time position. 
Okay, Sabrina. Thank you, Mayor Dyer. Um, I, I just, I'll, I decided to voice my opinion to discuss this matter. Uh, I thought it was very important because um, the last time that we really focused on uh, the Independent Citizens Review Board, I remember that the resolution was approved and that's great. Um, that's back in November of last year. And I, I think that uh, approving that legislation was key. However, that was probably, considering the process, one of the most simplistic things that we had to do. Now we have to do the work. Therein lies where we have to um, ensure that the development of the board takes <coughs> place. So from November of last year, we had the resolution approved. And then the next conversation that I hear, this is 2022. I don't know if that was in February or so, I'm not sure. But the next conversation I hear is about an interview committee being formed and then an application to select members for the board. So for me, that it seemed like there were some steps missing from passing the resolution, then now we're all of a sudden we're setting up an interview board and then we're considering sending out applications for people to be a part of the board. Well, what about all the outstanding issues that we had back in November that really have not been addressed? We haven't talked about it. And this is, you know, no, not trying to um, be disparaging upon anybody in terms of how this process has come forward, but the process has not been um, seemingly in, in order, I would say. Uh, and so when I'm asked by the citizens who saw us pass that resolution, they ask me, where are we? Where are we in the process? They want to know because they're watching us. And back in November, we told them by passing that resolution, we would do all that we were supposed to do in that resolution. And that includes developing the board um, yes, I, I don't have a problem and certainly agree that when the board is developed, they can certainly have input on selecting that director. Uh, that's, that's good. But before we get to selecting people, before we get to holding interviews, let's go back and look at those outstanding issues. Um, it, as was, one was mentioned um, by the mayor about who the, the body reports to. I think we do need to know that first. Uh, if we're agreeing to what the mayor has suggested, that's fine if that's what we agree to. Um, but we have to make sure that we're clarifying those outstanding issues first. Uh, that's one issue, who the board reports to. The budget, that's another issue. You cannot put people in place, hire people, without having a robust budget. I've never seen that happen. You have to have a budget before you can hire people or put people in place to be a part of a board, <coughs> and, and this particular board um, uh, in, in particular. So what uh, other things that, um, in terms of this process, with our other boards and commissions, I don't recall us ever selecting members to those boards before that board was developed. Just does not seem to be in sync with the process. So when I'm talking to citizens who are watching us develop this board, I have to answer their questions. And I cannot answer their questions in terms of the way things should be going if I don't see the process being followed. And so that's why I, I certainly requested that we talk about it and, and discuss it. I think it's uh, very important. And so in terms of training, I, I think it's already been laid out for us. 
in the task force report, they've laid out their recommendations. All we have to do is really implement them. So what I'm really looking for and what the citizens are looking for is uh, the implementation of what the task force recommended for training, uh, what they recommended in terms of um, reporting structure. I think the city manager also made mention of three options, um, but really for me it's just making the decision. We need to make the decision what we want to do in those areas um, before we actually go and recruit people to be a part of it. Um, and, you know, oftentimes it's good to have people a part of the board. Um, there are good people out there. I don't think they're going anywhere. I don't think, you know, after uh, there's going to be an issue with people who want to be a part of the board that they're not going to be available while we put these critical uh, pieces of infrastructure in place. Uh, we're building a foundation. If the foundation isn't set, if you don't solidify the foundation, you're going to have some cracks. You're going to have some issues. So set, I, I think it's so important, set it up right. Set up the foundation properly so that later on we're not having cracks, we're not having issues, we're not having dissension from the public. Again, they're watching us. They're asking questions. And they expect us to do what we said we would do when we passed the resolution back in November. And so um, that's really my comments is, is the process. If, if we could just make those decisions, build that infrastructure and that foundation uh, for this critical board. Because uh, as was mentioned previously, when um, things start happening with the uh, the boycotts and uh, the, the murder of George Floyd. Uh, we had the discussion way back then and was mentioned that what if something happens? Well, what if something happens in the interim and the, and the board is not set up properly? There will again be an outcry from the community asking, why didn't you do the right thing and set it up the right way? That's, that's all that I'm looking for. Um, that's all the community's looking for. And so I, I, I think we, it behooves us to, to really set this board up in the proper way and set, solidify the foundation, the infrastructure, before we start soliciting people to be on something that we have not fully developed. Just does not seem um, the proper protocol the proper procedure. Thank okay. you. Thank you, John. Well, I support the application. I support us go out and recruiting and getting people, I shouldn't say recruiting, getting people to put their names in nomination and following through with uh, a panel screening process which comes back before the whole board. On that, I'm all in sync and, we'll, and I appreciate the mayor was taking the responsibility that we're a little bit behind the power cord, but I think all of us share in that accountability, quite frankly, so I wouldn't take all that burden on yourself, Mr. Mayor. But, uh, but it, it is true, it is us. Now, relative to what you report to, I have a different experience from many people. I think many people may not be as familiar with the Inspector General's office, which are statutory members. They do stay within the executive branch, but they give their reports and findings in parallel to the members of Congress at the same time. We can recall back in the days of our former city manager and a police officer engagement on North Great Neck Road that, in fact, he is the senior law enforcement officer, despite what some other things say, but we found that out. Uh, and that thing, that was a lesson learned from that experience. But since he is in the chain of command line management, I find a concern about how do you assure the independence. I understand why we don't want to report to us, per se. That's 11 people. That's kind of crazy. Bad enough on the city manager, right? But, uh, the, but there's got to be something. So how do you mitigate that alignment? You can mitigate it in two ways. I do not believe the employee who supports the board should be a city employee. I think there's merit promotions they're going to want to get in. I think that person should serve at the pleasure of the board. How we decide that's done should serve at the pleasure of the board. 
I think the board should have its own legal con law attorney. And maybe the law office that bids and gets the contract provides the board support as part of that larger service contract. I believe if we're saying independent is what we want and objectivity, you can't achieve that with if the board isn't truly in control of who they get legal advice from and who, what, what member of the General Assembly would say, I want my assistant that supports me to be picked by the governor's office? I don't think anyone would, that would probably go over well. Back, that's not how it works. I think this board, if we want to be independent, should be resourced with their, to secure their own legal services so there's not a conflict of interest. And we can use that same body to support the level of labor they require. We don't take on the responsibility. We keep it clean as we want to be. Still reports to the city manager their results. I'm, I can live with But we've got to create within that framework true independence and having it be a city employee, I just don't think we're going to, we're going to get there because it's always going to be creating that doubt as to where the loyalty of the board, the person work for the board, is it with the city where they're an employee? And I've been in these environments. I'm not just speaking from a hypothetical. This is difficult. And or it's the board. So my recommendation, I will support the will of the majority, but my recommendation is it re I'm willing to accept working for the manager, but I do believe they should hire their own person through a service contract with attorney, whatever, and that they serve at the will of that board to create the objectivity, I think, that I won't say the community because I'm not sure who that is, but to serve and, dis and discount any appearance that the board is an objective and can't come to their own conclusions. Okay, anybody else at this point? You know, if I could just make a couple comments and then we'll throw it out, uh, you know, for direction. Uh, yes, uh, you know, it took a while, but let's uh, remember that we had a, a review commission up and running for a long time, and we were one of the few cities that did it. But I will be the first to tell you that it had a lot of, you know, cracks in that structure and was in need of improvement. So what I'm suggesting is that we at least start taking the initial steps. And, you know, right now, you know, I can kind of concur with having independent counsel for them. You know, that wouldn't be a problem. That would give the public a sense of it. But at least to get things rolling. But once again, as I said, it, once we get to the point, if it, uh, we have to have the, the fungibility, John, to make sure that, it, you know, if the role expands for any reason, you know, by the volume and what we're doing, uh, you know, we can certainly readdress and go in that direction. Okay, but <laughs> if, if it's okay with the council now, um, how about the first thing that we start appointing right now? Is anybody against that? Sending out the, making the talent bank form available to anybody, it's transparent, anybody can apply that lives in the city of Virginia Beach. Meets those okay. requirements. Uh, okay. I, 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 I've mentioned several times I'm against it. I just said that I'm against it. Um, you, you need to build the infrastructure. You need to, you need to solidify the foundation first. And, and I'm going to say here, I have to leave early because I have a family commitment. Uh, this is not the first time I've said that. Um, I, I, I'm not in favor of so sending out a talent bank application, selecting or asking for people to be a part of something we haven't developed. That's not the right process. You guys have a good evening. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? It, but once again, should we start at least building the team? Once again, let me reiterate, we already have an existing um, you know, we have a system inf the structure that needs major repair. So this uh, would function as an improvement. And Aaron? And we have a policy. Yeah. I understand that. I guess my, my concern is, and I know we're, we're getting into the budget, we just got the budget today. <coughs> have we assigned or even got into the bar part of what it would take for this um, um, body to be able to do its work? We're talking about separate counsel, them hiring a full-time employee, do we know what those that number even looks like? Yep. And I saw it in the budget where <laughs> it's there. He's on it. Mm -hmm. 
So we have um, we have an amount inside the budget that roughly can cover the cost of a FTE and incidental training needs for the position. Based on what we've seen so far, we don't anticipate it'll be a significant dollar amount, you know, in terms of um, outside legal services or anything like that, you know, based on the historic trajectory of what we've seen so far. But we do have an amount that we have program in the budget that could cover the cost of a FTE, a part-time staff, um, a legal contract and incidental training costs to train the board and also whoever is hired as the board coordinator Listen. if council decides to go down that direction. Aaron. And I know um, Councilwoman Wooten just had to step out, but I, I would truly like to understand what she further talked to her conversation about the infrastructure. If we're talking about proposed budget for this group, um, I think that's that's one thing. Um, but I would like to hear more of her thoughts and on that. So I'm, I'm not, it's just, or do we have to uh, make a decision today on this on this issue? Uh, I think we got to make some decisions today on this. Yeah. Issue. Uh, no. How about this direction today that is subject to modification? As we get the, the idea, I think Aaron is to get this thing rolling, and by having at least uh, a dedicated FTE, you know, having somebody you know uh, that would be responsible for. Uh, with the Minority Business uh, Council that would be ensuring compliance with the diversity study forever, okay? Uh, I'll be right with you. Um, and then having, you know, the, with the oh, human rights would just be a part of it. The IDEA Commission, and now we have a justify at least one full FTE about some other things. So I respectfully su suggest that we have some foundation in place, and, you know, we do have a board up and running, but it's it need, it, that foundation need, needs cracks need to get fixed. But at least by taking the first step and getting it going, and good organizations respond to internal and external demands of what came in, and we could certainly expand it based on need once it comes in. Guy, uh, I I'm going to speak to the point that John raised. Um, I've generally been on the side of keeping it in-house just for now and but I really um, considering John's comments I think he's I think his comments are well stated um, it's a cost issue I do think um, hiring outside counsel could you could administer you they could handle administering the commission as well as doing pure legal consultation also any uh, th they do that for a number of law firms do that for plenty of situations they they do that for associations and the municipalities all the time um, um, so I, d I don't think it's a clear and easy decision but I just wanted to make for the record, I wanted to say I, th I think John's convinced me on that point okay, that yeah, that would be the better course okay. of action. Ms. Barbara. Uh, it, it's been a while, but how many cases does the review board hear in a year? It varies. Um, it's hard for me to recall off the top of my head. Um, I can't recall a time when they saw more than 11. You know, um, and then sometimes they may get 11 and decide that they don't actually meet the the requirements to actually be heard by the board, right? But I don't, I can't, I can't, I, we, we sent a report out previously, but I can get some information back well, out to you. I know we've there. seen reports, and I, I think maybe it may have increased with all of this attention. So, but I mean, if we're going to be talking about what kind of employee is needed, we not we have to know the workload. Mm -hmm. And, and from the past, I think the workload has been, thankfully, very small. And so I, I think we really have to have that information when we know just what we're talking about. But I think that- uh, Folks in the gallery, could we be respectful? Thank you. I'm sorry, I wasn't looking. Maybe I missed something. Um, I think we go back to the report of that group that looked at this, and maybe that's what all, we all need to review, but- um, I think they, you know, they looked at the whole gamut, and 
I mean, we don't want to, I mean, a, a full-time employee who's sitting around not doing anything is what that we would like if we don't want the board to have a lot, but that wouldn't be being responsible from our standpoint in hiring somebody. So I think we really have to need, we need to know what we're looking at. Yeah, we shared the information before. We can share it again. Please. But I, I'll be okay, surprised. Yeah, but, but, but the other thing is we could have, if, if, if this council thing, we can have a, another follow-up conversation on this once we get some more stuff. Okay. So folks can be more comfortable. Yes. Uh, thank you. Ms. Henley reminded me of something. I think one of the reasons I was suggesting, uh, you know, a law firm is that I, I, I know the mayor would like to get some more work out of this FTE than just what he anticipates and that he's got needs. And I respect that and I'm sympathetic to that. On the other hand, I, as I said, I'm convinced from John's comments uh, about the need for independence. <coughs> and I think that the hi hiring somebody to do these additional duties further blurs and, may and confuses people about what is this person's in status in terms and the count and the council status in terms of independence. I mean, it, it seems to me if we got uh, we don't anticipate the need hiring somebody outside who is used to doing task they do it all oriented time. work and they do it all the time it makes a lot more sense yeah, than adding an FTE an uh, just to make sure we've got somebody there and then yes it would be convenient to get some other work done by but I, I just think it, I think that is confusing I think we can bargain for the services we need with outside firm and get a reasonably good yeah. value. So are you Rosemary. talking like a contractual worker? I'm talking like a contract with a law firm mm -hmm. to provide services, legal services and administrative services as well, both of which larger law firms, and there are plenty of them around here that are equipped to do, to do that and do it all the time. I think that sounds like a... That sounds, that sounds like... Sounds and then the other thing, though, Guy... But, uh, but once again, under the, uh, but see, once again, there will be assumption that if we have what you suggest and this board, uh, you know, adopts a chair, that, that is what gives it, uh, uh, um, independence and integrity in terms of being independent with integrity. And the other thing is if we were just to have the, uh, you know, administrative function, <clears throat> You know the person that Patrick would hire that would be multicast mm -mm. as just a contract in terms of administrative things and we don't need to you know logistics and stuff like that. It would have some. Uh, you know. Let's look at it both ways. I can see hiring this firm to do, and they they just handle it. Provide the legal what service. What else would be needed? Yeah. Let's let's look into that and just see what is needed. Okay. Mark, can you check into that? Like it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I can work with the manager to check into it. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't we do that? Yes. But let's talk to the manager. <laughs> so members and council, to be clear, um, what's in the budget, in the proposed budget, was that we included in the council line item roughly around $110,000 that could be used for a FTE, could be used for a part-time FTE, or it could be used for contractual services. So wherever council end up ultimately wants to land on that, we can use that, and it may not even come up to $110,000. It could be something less than that. But we've positioned it to give the flexibility based on the dialogue. But what I'm hearing from council right now is that Mark and I need to get together and then look to see what a yeah. contractual pathway to do this. Yep. So. How's and that sound, folks? Michael? Uh, I think that sounds good. I I've just been sitting here trying to process this conversation. And from it, I'm, I'm taking a couple of things away. First is, I don't see any harm in releasing the talent bank application to allow people to begin to apply. Yeah. Simply that. No appointments. I'm not, I, I would not be in favor of us making any appointments, but I think there's consensus around the application. And I also think that there's no harm in soliciting uh, applicants <coughs> to serve. However, I think where a lot of the frustration is coming from and that I'm hearing from the community independently is that um, I think people are looking for a better understanding 
of how the board will be structured and formed, and that's the basis for the conversation today. Um, but I think we have this great framework that was submitted by the advisory board that, from what I understand, has universal agreement. I've heard from members of the community who, um, who have confidence in the recommendations from the committee. I think there's general broad support from council for the recommendations and including even from law enforcement community. So I think what we need to do is just move forward to standing up the recommendations that were made by the committee. And, in t and I think that's the frustration we were feeling from our colleague about why, why, aren't, why haven't we stood that up. So I think we need to move expeditiously to stand up the committee on the basis that was presented to us by the uh, task force. And then I think once we do that, is the committee is looking for transparency, they're ultimately looking for confidence in this committee. And I think that if we form it based on the framework that was given to us, it has broad support from every, every, every aspect that I can see. So it, let's just stand that up, and they gave us the perfect framework, and I think that that will alleviate a lot of the tensions that we've experienced today. And I think that's the direction we're moving toward. But I don't think we should make any appointments to a board that we haven't stood up. And we've got a great framework, so let's just follow the framework. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's I think part of the uh, criticism is we haven't done anything. Right. You know? Got to start somewhere. And it took a very long time. And Amanda's worked very hard on getting this talent bank form ready. And yeah. it's ready, and, and it's probably going to take, what, 30 to 60 days to get that out and get it back in from people. Don't you think, Amanda? We can have the talent bank posted as early as tomorrow morning. I know. On the, but, but as far as take a while it, for, people for, to the, for folks to yes, and and absolutely. Okay, Patrick. Mm -hmm. um, Mayor, members of council, in response to council members Henley's question about how much do we typically see a year, staff provided the table that we shared with council back in August. I'll have staff updated and resend it again as a Friday package. But since 2013, to 2021, as of August of 2021, 2013 to 2021, has been 26 cases. We haven't seen more than six a year. But I, Mr. Mayor, okay. if I could. Okay. But John, then Aaron. One comment I would make, I'd be very leery of looking and making a linear extraction. Absolutely. I can only speak right. to the experience that the federal government had when they took a much more serious mm -hmm. and accountable right. look about sexual assault. The, once people knew that someone was really interested in acting on those complaints mm -hmm. and they were being objectively investigated, the complaints soared. Mm -hmm. So I think you have we have to be very careful looking back to say, is the, is the marketplace saying, hey, it doesn't pay to complain, nothing ever happens. Mm -hmm. And you may find out that the, looking back, there's a lot of latent demand. Hopefully that's not the case, but mm -hmm. you have to be thinking that there could be latent demand and therefore, when it is activated, that you're you're getting a, and it probably would be a spike and then would level off. But I, I I wouldn't rely upon a linear projection to say what the future workload would be. Good, Aaron, John. Okay, <laughs> that's good. good night. We got, got dittos tonight. That's a good thing. Okay, now if I can just kind of wrap this up and then we can get into executive. Um, the direction is that Mark and uh, Patrick will get together and figure out, you know, the, uh, the, the mechanisms to put into place uh, the hiring and what a consultant can do and approximate costs and things of that nature, and that we will concur that we will send out the talent bank applications but not a point until we have the infrastructure in space. Does that sound about right? Yeah. And we're going to get the talent bank, the ones that come in, to the interview team, right? So they can start looking at them? Pardon? I didn't understand you. Can the, no, when, no. as they come in, can the interview team Yeah, once we get them? the consultant on board. Uh, well, there's, why can't the interview team receive them and start looking at them? Um, well, I think. I, I think you should have them off ways. Yeah, I think all of us want to look at the applications, like we do all the boards and committees. And you know, and then you know, we can filter and send it to you know to you know yeah. another degree well, of right, scrutiny. It, right, as they come in, everybody can see them. Yeah, I, I think it's important that we as a council, 
at least, you know, keep our fingerprints on it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, certain people, you know, just might be, uh, you know, you know, not considered for a number of reasons. And then, uh, you know, if they can, then we can have an advisory group for a final, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay? Sounds good. Okay. Are we, yes, Michael. Mayor, what I have to segue, this seems very trivial uh, relative to the last discussion we had, but at the previous meeting we talked about the World 1000 returning. And they're having an event in May that I'd like to present a resolution uh, for to recognize that event in Virginia Beach. And um, I just want to make sure there's no objections on behalf of the council to preparing that, to asking the clerk to prepare those resolutions. Okay. If, if I could, yes. I remember you, you stating your, you're your grandfather, right? Godfather. Your godfather. You want to make sure you include him in that. that <laughs> Thank that. you. That resolution as well. That's Not that kind of Godfather. What Lim would said, Aaron, in New Jersey, Godfather has a totally different oh, I, interpretation. That's one of my favorite movies, so I get it. But I, I remember you speaking of your Godfather mm -hmm. um, very highly, so I, I would hope to I see his name that. in that, that resolution. Thank you very much. Um, we will do that. Okay, one other item, then we got to get into. Not to uh, delay things, but I did want to tell you the, the task force for youth violence that Bobby's. Uh, mentioned we have two fantastic co-chairs and that's uh, former chief Jim Severa and uh, Pastor Perez Gatlin mm -hmm. are going to uh, co-chair it so they're, and they're getting together tomorrow morning to start to start meeting in the process of it and, and as I mentioned before the, the mayors are going to be getting together from the 757 to you know get things uh, rolling Okay, if it's okay, folks, uh, we can uh, get, and, and listen, thank you to all of you for, you know, a really robust and good and interchange and discussion uh, on some, t you know, uh, tough subjects. In accordance with this uh, Virginia Beach City Code 2021. I'm sorry, can you adjourn the workshop so we can? Okay, oh, adjourn the workshop. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to adjourn the workshop. Approve the uh, closed session. Certify the closed session. Certify so the cl closed Second. session. Third. All right. Five out of ten to zero. You've certified the closed session in accordance with the motion to reset. Thank you. All right. Out by six.